I had always considered myself a practical joker, constantly pulling pranks on my friends and co-workers whenever the opportunity presented itself. However, my life took a dramatic turn, and I found myself in a situation that was no laughing matter. My story began in the swamps of Louisiana when I accepted a temporary gig clearing out an old, long-forgotten plantation mansion. The owner, Darius Carmichael, was an eccentric old man with unkempt hair and thick glasses who made his fortune as an inventor. He just referred to me as the help. One day, while working alone in one of the cramped, dark rooms of this decaying monstrosity, I stumbled upon a hidden chamber that contained a series of glass jars filled with an unnerving collection of twisted and mutilated animals. Each one had been expertly dissected, their eyes staring blankly into the abyss. I decided it was best to keep the chilling discovery to myself and focused on finishing up the job. A few nights later, we experienced an unexpected torrential downpour that forced everyone to seek shelter inside the mansion. As we sat around a creaky table in Darius's office, drinking whiskey by candlelight due to a power outage caused by the storm, he told us chilling stories about man-wolf hybrid creatures that were once believed to roam this region called Ruguru. My skin crawled at the thought. Suddenly, there was a crash from outside, capturing everyone's attention. We rushed out into the rain-soaked night only to find that someone had destroyed our equipment, almost strategically it seemed. Before we could react further or call for help, we heard an ominous growl echoing through the trees. The oppressive atmosphere grew heavier as we cautiously explored our surroundings. Some speculated that it could be wild dogs or some other predator that had been stirred up by all our activity in their territory. But I couldn't shake off the eerie feeling that something else, something far more sinister, was at play. The memory of those mutilated animals in the hidden chamber seemed to seep into my very bones. I suddenly found myself near the old barn that had been long abandoned and couldn't resist the temptation to look inside. With a chill running down my spine, I discovered several piles of torn and blood-stained clothing and implements of torture scattered across the dirt floor. The scent of death hung heavy in the air. My heart pounded in my chest as I heard the shuffle of feet outside the barn door. Without thinking, I scrambled up to an old hayloft to hide, keeping my labored breaths as quiet as possible, praying that I wouldn't be heard. Moments later, a monstrous creature lumbered into view, stepping slowly into the barn doorway. It was a horrifying amalgamation of man and wolf, just like the Ruger from Darius's tales. Its eyes were bloodshot and crazed, ferocious snarls punctuating each ragged breath. A surge of terror rushed through me as I watched helplessly from my hiding spot. The creature entered, its massive frame blocking out what little light filtered into this godforsaken place. It sniffed around, clearly searching for something, or someone. As it did so, it moved ominously closer and closer to where I was concealed. My fingers clung tightly to the damp wood underneath me as adrenaline fueled my muscles. As fate would have it, one of my fellow workers came running towards the barn, calling my name in a panic. His voice momentarily drew the beast's attention away from where I was hidden. My instant reaction was to call for help, but I realized my phone was still at the campsite. There was no way I could make it back without encountering the creature. The only logical course of action seemed to be staying hidden and waiting until it was safe to leave. While the creature focused on my co-worker, who was frozen in fear by its entrance, I knew it was a matter of time before the creature ended his life and potentially everyone else's. I had to do something. I scanned the hayloft for anything useful and spotted a metal pipe lying on the ground. Considering my options, 
I picked up the pipe and started tapping it on the wood in an attempt to draw the creature's attention towards me. At first, it didn't work, but after a few more taps, it seemed to catch its ear. The monster ripped its gaze from my co-worker and looked directly towards my hiding spot. It growled menacingly as its already bloodied claws scraped against the barn floor. With newfound determination and desperation fueling me, I threw the metal pipe out of a small window in the hayloft. As luck would have it, the pipe crashed loudly outside, distracting the creature and buying us some precious time to escape. My terrified co-worker seized this chance and stumbled out of the barn. The creature hesitated between pursuing him or coming after me in the hayloft, but ultimately decided to chase after him. I didn't waste another second. I jumped down from my hiding spot and ran through ankle-deep mud towards our campsite. My heart pounded in my chest while I struggled not to lose my footing in every step. I reached our campsite only to find chaos as more of these horrifying half-human half-wolf creatures emerged from the shadows of night. They lunged towards some of our team members, mercilessly tormenting them for their own perverse pleasure. I couldn't fight them. I couldn't investigate why they attacked. But I could not just leave my teammates behind. I knew I had to act, so I screamed at the top of my lungs, Everyone, run to the main road! Get out of here now! My unexpected outburst seemed to jolt my team members into action, and they began scrambling together towards the main road for help despite their injuries and fear. The creatures were relentless in their pursuit, but this time there was too much noise and activity for them to focus on one person at a time. It gave us a fighting chance. As we finally reached the main road, exhausted and battered from our battle for survival, our hearts dropped when we saw headlights approaching us with flashing blue and red lights. The police questioned us briefly before escorting the wounded to the hospital and promising that the area would be thoroughly checked. Over the next few days, reports came in of numerous mutilated creatures' remains found near our campsite, possibly eliminated by law enforcement or rival predators. The bodies confirmed these monstrous Ruguru were not paranormal entities, but products of twisted genetic experiments gone wrong. As law enforcement agencies continued investigating, we mourned those who didn't make it, our friends and colleagues tragically taken from us in that horrific ordeal. Despite everything that happened, we couldn't help but feel a humbling sense of gratitude that more of us hadn't suffered their fate. In the end, perhaps our willingness to act on instinct rather than succumb to fear was what saved most of us from becoming grisly trophies in this nightmarish battle between terrifying beasts and the force of human resilience. It was no secret that I wasn't what you'd call handy. Even a simple plumbing job would find me at my local hardware store thrice, in search of the right tools I thought I'd never need again. The day this ordeal occurred, I had just finished fixing a burst pipe when my phone rang. Hey, Frank, said an unfamiliar voice on the other end. It's Stanley Brooks from college. Stanley informed me that he had bought an old abandoned cabin about 40 miles north of Anchorage, Alaska. He asked if I could visit for a weekend to help with repairs and renovations. Feeling guilty for losing contact with an old friend over the years, I agreed. When I arrived at Stanley's place, it was late in the afternoon. The cabin was nestled deep within hilly forests, and surrounded by towering spruces heavy with fresh snow. After catching up over a cup of hot cocoa beside the crackling fireplace, Stanley handed me a list of tasks he wanted me to work on. As I wandered outside to assess equipment needed for the repairs, I heard a steady rustling sound coming from the forest nearby. 
It was odd to hear that sound since it hadn't snowed for hours now. Stan, I called out. Do you have any livestock or pets around here? No, nope, he replied from the doorway. I did see tracks around the property, though. Most likely some wild animals or maybe stray dogs passing through. Not wanting to seem overly nervous or paranoid, I brushed it off and got back to work. The next day was non-stop action, fixing creaky floorboards and replacing broken windows in preparation for winter weather. Amidst all these tasks, there were times where we heard unnerving sounds of snapping branches and rustling leaves circling around us. With each passing moment, my unease about whatever critter made those noises grew stronger. Dude, I said to Stanley, let's take a walk around the property and see if we can find whatever is causing those noises. Sure, he agreed. No harm in taking a look. As we walked along the edge of the densely wooded area, we suddenly found ourselves face to face with something neither of us had ever seen before. Standing on two legs like a man, with the physique of a wolf, was an enormous creature. Its fur was matted and filthy, and its piercing yellow eyes fixed unblinkingly on us. Stanley and I stood frozen on the spot, our hearts pounding in our chests. My blood ran cold as the creature stared us down, emitting a low, guttural snarl. This can't be real. I muttered, my voice barely above a whisper. But there it was before us, more monstrous than any Hollywood horror film could ever portray. Without exchanging any more words, Stanley and I slowly backed away from it. As we did so, the creature stalked forward one step for every step we took back, never breaking its gaze. The distance between us gradually increased as we moved deeper into the woods. Suddenly, Stanley stumbled over a buried log and let out a gasp of pain. This was the switch that sent our nightmarish encounter into full gear. With surprising agility despite its massive frame, the creature lunged at us bearing its razor-sharp teeth as it swiped its talon-like claws through the air. Run! Run! Stanley screamed at me, picking himself up from where he'd fallen. We dashed to safety while kicking up a frenzy of snow behind us. Every second counted as we tried to evade that otherworldly attacker and escape its clutches. With the creature in pursuit... Stanley and I ran harder than we ever had before. We scrambled over fallen logs and navigated our way through the dense forest, trying to put as much distance between us and the monstrous beast as possible. Our lungs burned with exertion as branches whipped against our faces. I could hear the creature's guttural snarls closing in on us, but I dared not look back. Why isn't it giving up? Stanley panted, his voice filled with desperation. I don't know, I replied breathlessly. But we have to keep going. We pushed ourselves to run faster, cursing each stumble that threatened to slow us down. We knew that if either of us faltered for even a moment, the creature would catch up and there would be no escape. As we continued our flight, we spotted a small cabin up ahead its windows broken and door hanging off its hinges. Though it offered an uncertain shelter from the creature trailing us, we decided to take our chances. Maybe we can barricade ourselves inside and call for help, Stanley suggested as we rushed toward the cabin. Once inside, we heaved a moldy couch in front of the door. The weight and bulk of it seemed enough to slow down the creature while providing us with some cover. Quickly, I urged Stanley. Find something to signal for help. Stanley retrieved his phone from his pocket but realized that there was no signal. Our hearts sank with disappointment. Our only option now was to wait it out in the cabin until morning and pray that help would find its way to us. For hours, we sat in silence, 
listening intently to every sound from outside and fearing that each one might be followed by those yellow eyes staring at us through a window or opening. Just when hope started flickering with each passing second, a new noise suddenly caught our attention, footsteps. They were not the heavy thuds of the creature, but rather the crunching of multiple human boots on crackling leaves and snow. Some distance from the cabin, flashlights flickered through the trees and the muffled sound of our names being called reached our ears. Stanley! Are you in there? The shouting voice grew louder, clearer. It was another work colleague, together with a small search party. Forcing adrenaline to replace fear, we dragged the couch from the door and tore it open. The chill air and relief that washed over us were indescribable as we stumbled into their arms, exclaiming that there was a monster roaming the woods not far away. The search party wasted no time in leading us back towards safety, armed with weapons to protect us all. The creature seemed to have vanished as quickly as it had appeared. No trace of it remained as we navigated our way home in fear-filled silence. Perhaps its appearance was enough to drive us away from its territory. We never returned to that eerie place surrounded by woods. While some speculated about wild animals or bizarre freaks of nature, we knew better than to claim any knowledge of what we had seen. That dreadful encounter left permanent scars on our minds. Something beyond rational explanation or understanding had threatened our lives. Years later, Stanley and I still avoid silent forests and dark nights spent outdoors. We don't mention our experience to others or dwell on it ourselves, for whatever monstrous force resided in those woods should stay hidden away forever. There will always be unsolved mysteries lurking at the edge of human existence. Perhaps it's those very mysteries reminding us that there are limits, even with all our progress, beyond which we are so terribly fragile and vulnerable. September 2005 I was working my usual truck route hauling freight through the dense forested area of Oregon. After driving for hours, I decided it was time for a break. I pulled up to an old gas station in the middle of nowhere and hopped out of my cab. My name's Paul Kleinfeld, by the way, and this was shaping up to be a day I'd never forget. As I was filling up my truck, I noticed something odd on the ground, several smartphone shards with dry blood smeared on them. The scene sent chills racing through me, but my curiosity got the better of me as I continued looking around. After paying for the gas and grabbing a quick snack inside, I returned to find a young woman standing near my truck. She introduced herself as Annabelle Gates and told me she had been hitchhiking with her friends when their car broke down further ahead. Feeling sorry for her, I offered her and her friends a lift to the nearest town. She happily agreed and led me to meet the rest of her group, Jeremy Maldonado and Roxanne Wharton. The three were heading to a nearby camping spot when their car's engine blew. As we were driving through the seemingly endless forest, Jeremy began sharing increasingly horrifying stories about past crimes that occurred in this remote area of Oregon. The unsettled look on Roxanne's face told me this wasn't what they had expected for their trip. The ride continued uneventfully until suddenly a disgusting smell emerged from somewhere outside the truck. It was overpowering. Even Roxanne gagged as we struggled to breathe through our nose plugs. Trying to lighten the grim atmosphere, Jeremy played a few riddles over his portable speakers. What has keys but can't open locks? He asked. A piano! Annabelle replied with an uneasy giggle. The next one caught everyone off guard. What has a heart that doesn't beat? As we pondered the answer in silence, 
The truck suddenly jolted and skidded off the side of the road, snapping us back to our gruesome reality. The engine roared, struggling to regain traction as we frantically attempted to get back on track. With a final heave, we managed to start moving again. But it wasn't long until we realized that trouble awaited us down the road. The smell lingering irrepressible in the air, I continued driving with ever-growing dread. Then, in the distance, I caught a glimpse of something unnerving, a man standing by a mutilated vehicle with its flashers on. He seemed to be examining a victim, almost inhumane, the acts he inflicted upon them. It dawned on us that he might be responsible for all the sinister occurrences in this remote area. As we drove closer, I tried to look away but found it impossible not to observe his grotesque features. Clad in bloodied clothes, he towered menacingly over his victim, ultimately revealing his unbelievably thick and mangled beard. It was then when he spotted us, Jeremy's sudden shriek had alerted him. The sinister figure began sprinting towards our truck with an unexplainable speed and force. Without thinking twice, I floored it trying to escape his wrath. The truck rumbled through the desolate forest path as chaos ensued inside. Faster! Roxanne screamed, watching the monstrous figure catch up with alarming speed. My heart pounded harder with each passing second. Why won't this beast just give up? As we raced down the broken road, I had one mission, keep us alive and out of his reach. In a panic, I swerved the truck around the sharpest turns, navigating between twisted trees and broken branches, my hands gripping the steering wheel as if my life depended on it. Roxanne, beside me, desperately attempted to dial for help on her cell phone but found no signal. The dense forest seemed to swallow our pleas for help, and our options were running out. As the monstrous figure charged after us relentlessly, Jeremy mustered the courage to face our pursuer through the rear window. Guys, we need to do something. He's not stopping. With limited weapons or resources, but a fierce determination to survive, we continued our desperate attempt to outrun him. Annabelle rummaged through the truck's content in search of anything useful. Seizing a heavy-duty flashlight from under a seat, she smacked it across her hand a few times before passing it to me. We burst through a clearing where an abandoned cabin came into view. Hesitant but left with no choice at this point, we rushed inside and barricaded the entrance as best as we could. The minutes dragged into an eternity as we held our breaths in expectation of another attack. When nothing happened for what seemed like hours, we felt a temporary relief, accounting an escape from his clutches. We were hungry and exhausted from this harrowing experience, and took turns resting while keeping watch for any sign of danger. As night fell, darkness enveloped the cabin with only flickers of moonlight illuminating it from outside. Jeremy was staying vigilant while we rested when he heard something scratching against the walls, like metal being dragged across wood. His breathing quickened as he motioned for us to wake up. Roxanne whimpered as she clung on to me, her voice barely audible. Please, any ideas? I racked my brain for any possible solution that might save us from this persistent nightmare. My gaze fell on the dilapidated chimney and an idea emerged. That chimney, it's our only chance. We have to climb out through it. Without any other options, we immediately came to a consensus and took turns climbing up the grimy brick shaft. It felt like an eternity, but one by one, we emerged on the roof, coughing and gasping for air the fresh air filled us with a mix of relief and renewed dread. As we carefully descended using the nearby branches of nearby trees, the sinister figure burst through the cabin door, shattering its remains. 
We scattered into the forest, desperately seeking cover and any semblance of safety. In that chaos, we got separated in our desperate bid for survival. I could hear Jeremy's scream in agony, followed by Roxanne's horrified cry as she stumbled upon his lifeless body. His heart ripped out, just like the mutilated victim we had spotted earlier. Annabelle and I locked eyes before dashing off in opposite directions. I couldn't bear another loss. As morning broke, I found myself at an abandoned gas station that appeared deserted for years. Desperate for help or comfort amidst this living nightmare, I rummaged through the dilapidated building to find something. The phone lines were down, but found a functioning radio transmitter inside a dusty cabinet. Under extreme duress and urgency, I contacted local law enforcement and pleaded for aid while fighting off tears as I recounted my friend's gruesome fate. The police arrived shortly after my agonizing wait that seemed to stretch for decades. After questioning and comforting me simultaneously, they launched a manhunt for the deranged killer still roaming these woods. They assured me that he would be caught, that no one else would suffer at his hands. I couldn't shake Jeremy and Roxanne's memory from my mind, friends taken from us too soon in a brutal fashion. Their sacrifice would not be forgotten. As I sat in the back of the squad car, surveying the ominous forest, I clenched the heavy-duty flashlight tightly and silently vowed that such a horrifying fate would never darken my life again. In the fall of 1999, my longtime friend, Danny Howell, invited me and a small group of friends on a weekend trip to the St. Sedan Park Forest Preserve in Illinois. Danny wanted to show off his new trail app that featured hidden local gems, like those eerie staircases in the woods we've heard so much about. At the beginning of our hike, I poked fun at his enthusiasm for our little adventure. Danny, dedicating your life to tracking unknown staircases? Maybe stick to Pokemon Go like everyone else. We spent hours exploring the forest and basking in its beauty. Though it was an enjoyable outing, we could all sense a steadily growing tension within our group as we nervously awaited some impending inevitability. The sun began to dip close to the horizon just as Danny excitedly announced that he'd finally found one of those ominous staircases. The wooden structure stood there awkwardly, a striking foreigner amidst the natural foliage. A wave of unease washed over us as we set foot upon the staircase. It should have been a mundane experience, just another hiking tale for future parties. But there was an inexplicable sense that our innocent getaway would soon spiral into something far darker than any of us could have anticipated. As my hand grazed the deteriorating wood railing on our way down, I came across something sticky between my fingers. I retracted my hand as if bitten by a snake and studied it closely. Caked blood clung to my fingertips. The group gasped and immediately bolted back up the staircase to find another path through the woods all except my best friend Malika who was transfixed by something far off in the distance. I tried calling out her name but she seemed entranced by what lay before her, eyes wide with terror. What followed is still difficult for me to describe with any coherence. Emerging from behind one of those thick oaks appeared a creature the likes of which I had never seen before, its hulking frame barely obscured by the trees. Its massive, clawed hands dragged along the mossy floor, locked in a predatory slouch. As soon as my gaze fell upon it, my voice was ripped from my throat and I became frozen in place. The dreadful being approached on all fours like a bear but with a twisted, elongated body that seemed to defy nature itself. Its skin was a patchwork of gray and black scales interspersed with tufts of matted, bristly fur. 
although I could not make out any distinctive facial features, a warm, malodorous breath emanated from somewhere beneath the mass. It lunged towards Malika before we could react. Wrapping her arm gently in its talons, the creature seemed to pierce through her subconscious and implant some obscure knowledge that did not belong in her mind. Malika began to convulse uncontrollably while emitting an anguished scream that burned into my memory. The horoscope unfolded around us. What should have remained on those unread pages of a Stephen King novel was now unfolding before our very eyes. Suddenly Danny shouted something from behind me some sort of confirmation code he'd earlier found using his app. It was like an incantation in modern words luminescent symbols shining forth from his screen. With surprising obedience, the creature halted like a scolded dog and loosened its grip on Malika's broken figure. We finally found the strength to move as adrenaline began pumping fervently through our veins. I tried to force Malika's limp frame into action but sensed an almost phantom weight bearing down on us both. Struggle as we might there seemed no escape from this sudden paralysis. We tried our best to move, sensing Malika's situation was worsening. Her face contorted in pain, and she lay gasping like a fish out of water. I knew we couldn't keep standing there, the creature's eyes locked onto us, ready for another attack. Danny! I shouted, dragging Malika toward the forest. Get help! We'll try to make it to the truck. Danny hesitated for a moment before nodding and sprinting off into the woods. The creature let out an ear-piercing screech and lunged in our direction again, but fell short as its massive body became entangled in the underbrush. I pulled Malika along as fast as humanly possible without tripping over branches or getting snagged by vines. As we stumbled deeper into the woods, panic set in despite our adrenaline-pumped states. What could we do against such a monstrous foe? Where would we find safety in this endless maze of trees? That's when we spotted something unusual. A lone staircase stood amidst the chaotic forest scene, seemingly leading to nowhere but reaching far up into the canopy. We made it to the truck after what felt like a small eternity but my curiosity wouldn't allow me to abandon those strange stairs without investigating. I helped Malika into the truck and told her I'd be right back. With a mixture of fear and determination rolling through me, I sprinted toward those enigmatic steps. I reached them quickly but hesitated before starting my ascent. How could something so out of place exist within these woods, seemingly untouched by time or nature? The possibility of some connection between them and the creature entered my mind. Maybe climbing them would grant me knowledge or safety from this nightmare. At last, setting my doubts aside, I stepped onto the first stair and began ascending rapidly all my senses heightened for any danger that might lay ahead. When I reached the top, I saw something surprising, a small wooden box with a handwritten note taped on it. Here lies knowledge of thy enemy. It read. I opened the box carefully as silent dread coursed through me. Inside lay an old, weathered piece of paper with handwriting that looked centuries old. It contained information about the creature we encountered, details about its origins, and how it had been encountered before in this region. The note named it as a skinwalker capable of penetrating victims' minds and causing them immense pain and torment. The reasons for its attacks were unclear, but it seemed to revel in chaos and destruction. Fearful that Malika was still in danger, I raced back down the stairs and made my way back to the truck clutching the paper tightly as if my hand could somehow contain the terror of the night's events. As I reached Malika, she was barely conscious her eyes glazed over and her breathing shallow. Realizing that getting help was now more crucial than ever, I hurriedly popped open my phone and dialed 911 my frantic voice attempting to convey our dire situation to the operator. 
Within moments, sirens wailed in the distance while Danny emerged from the other side of the forest, pale and shaken but seemingly unharmed. As we gathered around Malika waiting for help to arrive, I couldn't shake an uneasy feeling this wasn't an isolated incident or a chance encounter with a rare cryptid. It felt as if something darker was lurking beneath it all. The paramedics arrived in record time, hurrying Malika onto a stretcher while she clung to life. We followed their ambulance until we made it to the hospital where Malika was quickly admitted into intensive care. Overwhelmed by exhaustion and anxiety, Danny, Malika's family, and I huddled in the waiting room. Each person took turns breaking down or trying to comfort one another, but no one felt truly at peace not with those horrific memories still lingering in our minds. One thing was unshakably clear. Our world had been forever changed by our encounter with the nightmarish skinwalker. My name is Zeke Emerson, and I currently reside in a secluded cabin in the heart of the Alaskan wilderness. Living off the grid wasn't my initial plan. However, a sequence of unfortunate events led me to this isolated existence. It all began six years ago when I received a peculiar phone call telling me that I inherited a property deep in the Alaskan wilderness from an estranged family member. My arrival at the inherited property took me aback due to its desolate location, miles away from civilization and with no neighbors to be seen. After settling in, I started digging into my family's past out of curiosity and discovered long-forgotten history connecting me to this place. I felt blessed initially. The isolation allowed me to escape from small talk and the unending barrage of office politics. Oddly enough, I found solace in solitude, guiding me to believe that the wild itself was my true calling. However, as time went on, strange events began happening around my cabin. Initially, I attributed these occurrences to being out of touch with society and needing to adapt to living alone. At first, it was distant howls deep in the forest or quick flurries of movement in my peripheral vision. Was paranoia my new roommate? Or just some wild animals roaming around? Then it happened the single most horrifying event that shattered my peaceful existence once and for all. Dusk was setting in as I returned from chopping firewood nearby and glanced across my front porch. The sky gradually darkened with the last remnants of sunlight fading by giving way to stars flickering through thick black sky whilst chills ran down my spine for what's about to unfold. I reached out to open my door when something caught my eye in the window's reflection, a flash of eerie eyes peering at me from the tree line ahead followed by a chilling sound that defied all logic a cacophony of human screams intertwined grotesquely with the roars of a demented animal. Rooted to the spot, unable to process what I had witnessed, a figure emerged. A monstrous being with contorted elongated limbs, animalistic features shrouded by matted fur, and an unnerving glisten in its eyes. In panic mode, I barged into my cabin slamming the door behind me, frantically reaching out for my rifle and hand quivering from undefined fear realizing that whatever stood before me was either human nor a conventional beast. What the hell is happening? I shouted at myself gripping the rifle tightly like a life belt till cold steel melted against my moist palm. Silence consumed the area resonating within eerie darkness that was unleashing itself on my quaint home. Suddenly thunder cracks electrified surrounding as scratch marks shredded door echoing invasion of wild predators lunging violently across hostile terrain showing no signs of unlocking its sharpest talons from drawer chest. Breathing heavily, too frightened to even blink, I leveled the gun towards the door. Hyper alert to every sound in the debilitating silence, 
remembering folklore about a powerful creature known only to the elders from indigenous tribes resided in this area, known for its bloodthirsty appetite for humans. The thought made me shiver but doubted if this mythical beast was stalking me? Or just an urban legend? Beastly shrieks pierced through the silent air testing my sanity. The door started to give away under relentless pressure exerted by unknown forces ready to storm in with malicious intent. Then my phone rang abruptly shattering the tensity momentarily causing a disruption in adversary's dance. Turning swiftly towards the source attempting to make out familiar words. Seek! Seek! You all right? What's going on? Loud enough to be identified whatever siege was about take place. It was Carl Johnson, a helicopter pilot who flies supplies monthly visiting outposts like mine further into the wilderness, my only connection to the outside world. Carl! I don't know, there is someone or something outside my cabin. My voice quivered with fear as I stuttered each word rapidly whilst exhaling heavy breaths that were battling unsuccessfully against rising panic levels within me. Hold on, Zeke. I'm taking off now. Just try and stay safe. He exclaimed with a sense of urgency saturated with genuine concern in his voice. I tried to barricade the door with whatever furniture I could find a table, chairs, anything that could buy me some time. But the creature's relentless pounding continued. The phone, still connected to Carl, transmitted our conversation and my panicked breathing. Carl shouted over the sound of the helicopter blades. Zeke! I'm fifteen minutes out from your place. Block the doors and windows! Following his advice, I rushed to block every window, while the sounds of the creature ravaging persisted outside. Time seemed to stretch out as though my life was hanging in balance. Suddenly, the banging stopped. The eerie silence felt suffocating. With a cautious heart, I peered out a tiny crack on my barricaded window. It was gone. Carl's voice came through the phone. Seek! I'm landing right now! Get outside! I hesitated for a moment but took the chance. Bursting out of my cabin and sprinting towards Carl's helicopter that had touched down a few meters away from me. Hurry up! Carl yelled from his seat. As I approached closer, I noticed a trail leading towards a staircase in the nearby woods. Staircases rumored in hushed whispers among locals. That served no real purpose. Just when I was right about to board the helicopter, there it was again stalking us in plain sight the creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It had dark fur all over its body and elongated limbs with sinister-looking claws. It posed stoically by the staircases revealing white gnarly teeth as it snarled with seething rage in its yellow eyes. Carl, we, we have. Words failed me upon laying eyes on this monstrous fiend. He caught sight of it as well and instantly started lifting off. The creature snapped back into motion and charged at full speed toward us. Too late for it as we were already gaining altitude, leaving the terrifying beast behind. What was that thing? Carl shouted as we put some distance between us and the monster. Once settled down, still horrified but thankful for our escape, I recalled our daring run to Carl. He could not hold back his disbelief. After a moment of silence, he mentioned having heard stories about a cryptid creature called Wendigo. The description matched the creature we had just witnessed. We exchanged uneasy glances as Carl continued flying towards civilization. Days after, still haunted by the harrowing experience, I left my forest outpost, seeking newfound shelter and safety among populated areas. The Wendigo had become a reality for me rather than a thing of myth and legend its sinister presence forever imprinted in my mind. TBH 
I sometimes find myself looking back at that fateful day spent with Carl, remembering an encounter that would change our lives forever, reminding me of the bravery we displayed in the face of imminent danger, pushing limits to their bounds escaping the clutches of a cryptid monster from local folklore. With every pulse of my adrenaline-fueled veins, I know deep down that those memories will profoundly be ingrained within us until death parts us from this world. In 2014, something happened that I'll never forget. The incident is etched into my memory as if it were just yesterday. I remember picking up my cell phone and accidentally dialing Kenny Loggins instead of Kelly Logging, my best friend at the time. It was a small blunder that would spiral into an unforgettable experience involving a horrifying creature. My name is Simeon Greyfeather. I'm a Native American assigned to a secret unit that deals with hunting and eradicating dangerous folklore creatures. We are part of a more extensive special organization composed exclusively of Native Americans with knowledge in traditional monster hunting methods handed down through generations. We don't usually get permission to use firearms, but this time they gave us the green light. As part of a mission for members from our team, including myself, had to travel to the swamplands of Louisiana. We had heard rumors about strange occurrences taking place in an isolated area outside New Orleans. Our first day there began without any hiccups, although tension filled the air as we set up our operations center in a rundown house deep within the swamp. Everyone was on edge, more so when our leader, Shaveo Stonefish, revealed his great-uncle's bizarre journal which recounted encounters with a terrifying creature that prowled these lands years ago. On our second day in the swamp, we stumbled upon a gruesome scene off the beaten path that made my stomach churn and my heart pump wildly. Two mutilated bodies, one male and female, were found suspended between two cypress trees by their wrists. They were gutted and drained out dry like old cigarettes. In no possible way could a human have done this act. The terror on their faces preserved perfectly by an excruciating demise that sent shivers throughout my entire being. That night around dinner, Nidawi running water broke the tension with a witty joke. How do you catch a squirrel? He questioned, his eyes twinkling. Climb a tree and act like a nut. Laughter erupted around the table easing the dreadful atmosphere, even if just for a fleeting moment. But our jovial moments were to be short-lived. We were informed by our superiors about an eyewitness report mentioning that the creature we saw blended in with its surroundings, looked like an animal and had long, sharp, bone-like protrusions growing from its back. Our search intensified, and we split into pairs, carefully patrolling the swamp area. Our unit leader, Shaveo Stonefish, and I headed towards the northern part of the swampland. With the murky waters beneath us and gnarled trees hanging low above us, it was impossible not to feel the suffocating grip of fear tightening around us as even more grotesque murders emerged in quick succession. As Shaveo and I waded through the sludge, we heard rustling movements in the distance. I could suddenly see out of my peripheral vision glinting eye-like objects in nearby foliage before it promptly vanished into thin air, leaving me questioning my sanity. But then it showed itself. A foul odor overpowered my senses before its repulsive features emerged before us, an amalgamation of slithering scales, decomposing fur, and distorted human-like features that were enough to send shudders down my spine. At first glance, I thought it had horns sticking out of its back like an elk's antlers, but upon closer inspection realized they were long bones tipped wickedly sharp at their ends. Suddenly it attacked. 
It was faster than any creature we'd ever encountered ducking and dodging between trees effortlessly. As if to mock us somehow, it seemed to perform some sort of cruel dance as it lashed out with its grotesque appendages. Between the branches, I saw Nidawi and Kanthi Cornbeard engaged in their separate battle with the creature, and it became apparent that we were underestimating its shape-shifting abilities. It could be in multiple places simultaneously using wicked contortions of time and space. My team and I knew we had to take advantage of our guns before our adversary could overwhelm each of us. Nidawi fired the first shot which grazed the creature causing it to screech in pain. That's when the swamp seemed to come alive all at once with a chorus of horrific screeching. The screeching grew louder and more persistent, seemingly coming from all directions. My team and I exchanged helpless glances unsure of our next move. Our adversary was becoming more emboldened with each passing minute, eagerly anticipating its next attack. Suddenly, I felt something wet and slimy hit my shoulder from above. I looked up in horror, seeing pieces of decaying matter falling around me. The creature had climbed high into the trees, leaving bits of itself behind as it moved to attack in a different way. My team and I began to panic. It was clear we needed help, but calling for backup would only expose us to the possibility of losing more people to this monstrosity. We were deeply torn between protecting ourselves and putting others in danger. Nonetheless, we knew we couldn't face this enemy alone. My voice shaking, I grabbed the radio and called for immediate assistance. I need backup at our location. We're under attack by an unknown creature, I shouted into the radio. Hesitating for a moment while listening for a response, I heard a distant but determined voice. Backup is on its way, just hold on. With potential reinforcements on their way, we tried to regroup and find cover in the maze-like series of tangled trees and vines but there was no place to hide from the creature's unrelenting assault. As Nidawi exchanged fire with the beast up ahead, Kanthi Cornbeard fought desperately alongside her. It surprised us with a Herculean leap towards Kanthi. Its putrid teeth sank deep into his leg. Kanthi screamed in pain but fought back with determination. He struck at its face repeatedly with any weapon close at hand but it continued to tighten its jaws around his leg. Nidawi rushed forward in an attempt to save Kanthi from this nightmarish grip but it proved futile. In one swift motion, the creature detached Kanthi's leg from his body and vanished as quickly as it appeared. We all stared at the scene, desperate to help our injured comrade. Moments later, backup arrived a team of heavily armed soldiers who quickly assessed the situation. Kanthi was sent to a nearby medical facility while the rest of us were urged to evacuate the area. We were horrified by what had occurred and knew that confronting this creature again would only invite more suffering. Grudgingly, we followed orders and regrouped outside the swamp. As we filed our reports and tried to make sense of what had happened, one of my comrades mentioned an old newspaper article about a local legend, a cryptid known as the Skunk Ape. They said that the description of the creature in the article eerily resembled our attacker. I don't believe in folklore, I interjected bitterly. All I know is that something is out there and it took a part of Conti with it. Days after our encounter, we learned about a group of researchers who had been studying cryptids within the region. They'd been focusing on sightings of something they called the Skunk Ape. What they'd discovered both fascinated and horrified us. Based on their evidence and descriptions from previous witnesses, it was undeniable that this Skunk Ape had been responsible for our torment in the swamp. Though we never confronted this evil again, it was hard not to think about Kanthi and everything we had gone through together. We had come face to face with something straight out of legend but in doing so, 
we'd also witness firsthand its ability to inflict unimaginable pain. Our lives were forever changed by an encounter we couldn't possibly foresee and, ultimately, still struggle to understand. The gruesome reality of what happened in that swamp will continue to haunt us but now we know better than anyone. Sometimes, even what appears to be folklore can be filled with truth. This creature existed, and it had malice beyond our wildest imagination. The memory of Kanthi's mutilation will stay with us forever and serves as a chilling reminder that there may be more lurking in the shadows than we'd ever dare to believe. I stumbled over a loose cobblestone, feeling the ache in my legs from the long hours of this mission. My name is Dalton Archer, a Navy SEAL tasked with unraveling an unsettling series of murders happening in a quaint New England town. The scenic, picturesque location belied the gruesome reality lurking in the shadows. Stepping into the town's local bar, I struck up conversation with a couple of locals to gather any leads on this elusive villain. They shared hushed whispers about an unspeakable creature that roamed at night, though the descriptions remained vague and inconsistent something not entirely unexpected in a sleepy town fueled by gossip. As a man of logic and military training, I remained skeptical. The following evening found me planted outside an eerily empty house near the edge of town, one which was ground zero for one of these horrifying incidents. Investigating the scene, I discovered what looked like scratch marks running along the walls and floorboards. The marks were so fine, it was like they were etched with needles rather than claws. Hey, why don't fish ever have to do their own laundry? A sudden voice caught my attention, and I turned to find Henry Blackwell, fellow Navy SEAL and trusted comrade sent to assist me on this mission. Not expecting humor in such a grim setting, I couldn't help but raise an eyebrow as I asked him why. Because they always drop their dirty laundry off at the nearest cleaning krill. He grinned for a moment before regaining his serious demeanor. Any updates on our target? As we discussed our findings in hushed tones by the light of our flashlights, we heard branches snapping nearby. Stealing ourselves as hardened soldiers do, we aimed our guns toward the direction of the noise. We cautiously stalked closer to various low-hanging trees and shrubbery when we saw it, a scaly creature with elongated limbs, an amalgamation of a man and beast. Its sickly skin glinted in the limited light and its beady eyes seemed to stare into our souls. A sharp pain caused me to stumble backward, my hand reaching to clutch a fresh gash on my arm. Henry quickly grabbed and pulled me away from the creature's next anticipated attack as I tried to focus on the exact point where the injury occurred. We retreated, resuming our stealthy approach, but observing the creature from a safe distance. It continued to torment us, perfectly matching our movements yet vanishing from view with each attempt at confrontation. The night air began to feel heavy as we realized our close quarters with a dangerously unknown predator. As we circled the town, worn out but determined, we found ourselves in front of an abandoned warehouse. We shared a cautious glance and slowly reached for the rusted door handle, cold sweat trickling down our brows. Inside lay the gruesome evidence of previous encounters, dismembered limbs strewn about, and blood that had dried forming intricate patterns across the concrete floor. My radio crackled to life with an urgent message from headquarters urging us to track down the menacing being that had disrupted this once quiet town. Nodding solemnly at each other, Henry and I geared up for the final showdown, aware this might be our last mission ever. The warehouse echoed with sounds of our heavy breathing as we moved further in. Suddenly, a figure emerged from behind a stack of old crates, silhouetted by moonlight streaming through a broken window. 
It was the creature we had been hunting all along emaciated limbs splayed outwards like spindly branches. Its menacing gaze sent shivers down our spines as it unfurled its horrific wings and swooped towards us with ferocious speed. In a desperate attempt to escape the creature, Henry and I ran through the warehouse, knocking over stacked crates and debris in our path to slow it down. We could hear its screeching growls growing closer, and there was no denying that the creature wanted us dead. We couldn't afford to call for help, fearing the creature would catch up while we were on our phones, so we continued our frantic race. We finally stumbled upon a series of rusty pipes running along a poorly lit corridor. My instinct told me that this could be our only chance at survival. With no other choice in sight, I turned to Henry and urged him to follow me as we began clambering along the pipes. We advanced cautiously, all the while listening for any signs of the creature's movements. Suddenly, I heard a distant scream echoing from afar. Panic surged through my body as I realized it must be another victim who had crossed paths with our monstrous hunter. The scream ceased abruptly, another casualty in this nightmare. Our own peril remained imminent, and we couldn't waste time mourning the unknown victim. As we progressed further along the twisted maze of pipes and corridors, with luck seemingly on our side, the creature remained at bay for now. We finally reached a large door marked. Exit. Elation mixed with exhaustion. Maybe this ordeal was finally coming to an end. As we pushed open the door with trembling hands and stepped outside, we found ourselves in a secluded alleyway. Relief washed over us as we started to walk towards civilization when we suddenly heard an ear-piercing screech from behind us. The creature had found us again. It lunged out of nowhere with blinding speed and tackled Henry to the ground, its elongated limbs flailing wildly, trying to cause maximum damage. It bit into his leg with its jagged teeth as Henry cried out in unbearable agony. Mustering all my courage, I picked up a metal rod and struck the creature's head with all the force I could muster. Startled by the impact, it loosened its grip on Henry's leg and backed away allowing us the precious seconds we needed to limp hurriedly towards a crowded street. Spurred on by sheer adrenaline, we burst out into the open, with dozens of people around us. The creature hissed menacingly, unwilling to launch an attack in front of such a large crowd. Seizing this opportunity, I yelled for help and immediately grabbed my phone to call 911, hoping they would believe our horrifying story. The police quickly arrived on the scene but found no trace of the grotesque attacker. We shared our experience with them as well as information about the abandoned warehouse and its gruesome remains of previous victims. Distraught and utterly exhausted, we were taken to a hospital for medical attention to address our numerous injuries. In the days following the attack, an extensive search was conducted for both the creature and its lair. Forensic teams thoroughly examined the warehouse, discovering and identifying a few victims who went missing from the town months earlier. Henry and I found some solace in knowing that closure was possible for their families. As for our beastly tormentor, it was never found. Hundreds of questions haunted our minds. What spawned this hideous monster? How had it managed to avoid capture for so long? And where could it be now? The uncertainty gnaws at us constantly. But one thing is for sure. Our once quiet town will never feel safe again. In memory of those who perished at the hands of this abomination, Henry and I have dedicated ourselves to ensuring that their stories are not forgotten. We share their tragic tales with our community, serving as a reminder to stay vigilant in hopes that one day, justice will be served and all this while deeply breathing in gratitude for our own survival, knowing that we had just barely escaped the clutches of a predator who still may lurk in the shadows. Mm -hmm. 
As I hobbled through the dimly lit forest, madly grasping at the agonizing punctures in my leg, I couldn't help but wonder how an evening that started off so peacefully had turned into the most disturbing ordeal of my life. It was mid-September, a rare time when the leaves were just starting to change colors, and a nip of crispness filled the air. The campfire crackled merrily as my childhood friend Derek and I were reminiscing about our youthful exploits. Sitting on a couple of rickety chairs under the vast, wide sky filled with stars, our laughter echoed through the calm New Hampshire night. Life couldn't get more idyllic than this. As Derek prepared to join me by the blazing fire after fetching some more logs, he tripped over something and landed face first on the ground. Shocked, we stared at three gruesomely disfigured bodies sprawled carelessly at his feet. These unfortunate souls looked like they'd been mauled by wild animals. There were huge chunks of torn flesh and blood oozing from eviscerated bodies onto the forest floor. After catching our breath, we unanimously agreed that a wolf or bear must have been responsible for this gory sight. What are we going to do now? I asked. We need to call for help, Derek replied. But when he took out his phone, there was no signal in this secluded area. We'll have to make a beeline back to town first thing tomorrow, he asserted. As if on cue, a rustle from behind caught our attention. Trying my best not to yell out in pure terror, my heart pounded violently against my chest as we saw those haunting yellow eyes staring back at us through the darkness. I reached for the baseball bat lying nearby and gripped it tightly while Derek held onto a kitchen knife. Despite our seemingly futile attempts at self-defense, it was better than standing there helpless. That's when it emerged from the shadows, a grotesque, hulking behemoth with sharpened claws dripping in crimson gore, nothing like any known creature or entity. Attempting to sidestep the monstrosity, I whispered, Why did the chicken go to the seance? To talk to the other side. But my joke had no effect on this nightmarish entity. It only made me realize the absurdity of our predicament. A gut-wrenching scream tore through the night as Derek charged towards the creature with his knife, seeking to avenge our violated sanctuary. Unfortunately, our assailant easily parried his blows before flinging him back several feet into the underbrush. Seeing that Derek might be injured or worse, I forced myself into motion. In that adrenaline-driven state, I swung my bat with all the strength I could muster. The impact sent a shiver along my arm as I connected with what felt like a rock-hard skull. Enraged by this feeble attempt at resistance, it snarled ferociously and lunged at me swiftly, its enormous claw rending through my thigh like a hot knife through butter. In a desperate attempt to flee, or perhaps due to sheer survival instinct, we limped and crawled in unison towards our vehicle parked at the edge of the clearing. The ominously sullen creature pursued us relentlessly through the now-twisted, devilish thicket. Its malevolent cackles reverberated all around us as we struggled to escape the gluttonous appetites of this unspeakable horror. As our limbs weakened from pain and fear, I managed to catch a glimpse of the monstrous creature. Its thick fur, matted and slick with what appeared to be blood, covered its muscular, almost humanoid frame. Its sunken eyes blazed like twin flames craving destruction, reminding me that this abomination shared nothing with the world I knew. In a final desperate attempt to get help, I fumbled with my phone while Derek struggled with maintaining the pace of our escape. Oh God, please let me have reception now, I thought as my trembling fingers dialed 911. A wave of relief washed over me as the operator picked me up. I quickly explained our situation and pleaded for help before dropping the phone in my haste to keep moving. We finally reached the car, Derek leaning heavily on me as we crossed into the outskirts of the woods. 
Expecting to see the horrifying creature in hot pursuit, I stole a glance behind. It was gone. But our relief was short-lived. The painful groans from Derek signaled that his injuries were far worse than we'd feared. I got him into the car as swiftly as possible and floored the gas pedal toward the nearest hospital, praying that we had bought enough time to put some distance between us and that nightmare lurking among the trees. At the hospital, Derek was rushed into surgery while I received stitches from my own wound. The police arrived shortly after and questioned me about our encounter back at camp. Despite explaining every horrifying detail, their expressions conveyed a mixture of doubt and pity that was infuriating. Even after sifting through our mangled gear at the campground, they still treated us like a couple of attention-seeking hikers. It wasn't until they came across the mutilated body of a local ranger among the crushed remnants of our site that their skepticism turned to a ghastly realization. With Derek left weak and yet alive by his injuries and myself sporting a scar that would remain in defiance of time's healing touch, the nightmare we faced finally ended. Our lives took drastically different paths after that fateful night. Derek never fully recovered from the physical scars left by that beast, and my psychological wounds proved harder to heal. I moved to a city far from the woods, fearing what might lurk unseen, yet its mocking laughter always haunted me. The more I attempted to forget those tormented moments, the more persistent they became, burning images into my mind like a cruel artist imprinting them onto an unwilling canvas. The police never caught our attacker or found any trace of what it was. They determined the ranger had met his end due to a rogue bear, but we knew better than to accept this flimsy explanation. Many nights find me back within those dark woods during uneasy dreams, alone, bloodied, and lost to all hope. Even as the chilling laughter of an unseen terror rings through my consciousness, I feel driven to return time and time again. In vain hopes of finding peace, perhaps someday I will uncover the truth about the grisly events that took place within that forsaken glade. Until then, I can only mourn for those we left behind and cling to dry branches of sanity amid an unending storm of dread and doubt. Unknown to many, there's a secluded spot near the beautiful shores of Lake Michigan that's perfect for a weekend getaway. After months of working tirelessly, I decided I needed a break and planned a camping trip to unwind at this peaceful haven. My RV was fully stocked and ready for my two-day escape from the rat race. It was September 2019 when I made this fateful trip. With warm sweater weather perfect for exploring the lakeside trails, it was an enchanting time of year to visit. Dwayne Cunningham, one of my oldest friends, agreed to join me on this stress-relieving sojourn. As we arrived at our campsite and set up the RV in the daylight, its charms were evident from the beginning. The foliage casts brilliant shades of orange and yellow, while the cool breeze carried enticing scents from nearby bonfires and marshmallow roasts. Our first evening passed with pleasant conversation around the fire pit, accompanied by laughter and those unique jokes that only longtime friends could share. We retired to our respective bunks and slept like logs until we were woken by an odd clattering sound outside. In the still dark morning hours, Dwayne nudged me awake nearly out of breath with panic. He whispered that he'd heard something sinister near our RV, perhaps someone trying to pry open our door. My initial skepticism stemmed from his tendency toward overreaction, but the moment my tired eyes locked onto his terror-stricken face, alarm surged through me. Wary of making any noise, we peered out through tiny gaps in the window blinds to investigate. 
The barely visible figure outside was tall and gaunt. Its posture stooped as it worked at the door handle with an assortment of crude bladed implements. Though cloaked in shadows, his physical features were unmistakable. Dull eyes beneath a furrowed brow and a twisted mouth concealed only by straggly strands of filthy hair. Fear gripped us as we struggled to understand why an assailant would target us in this picturesque setting. But now wasn't the time for conjecture. The door handle rattled with increasing force and urgency, rendering us paralyzed and unable to formulate a reasonable plan. Why hadn't we thought to pack a weapon or devise an emergency strategy? Our cell phones were rendered useless as no reception reached this isolated corner of the world. Desperation fed our need for action. Without a word, Dwayne grabbed one of his fishing poles and hastily fashioned it into a makeshift spear. Considering our choices, I opted for a jagged tent stake, its splintered edges held together by a fraying strip of duct tape. With weapons in hand, we shared one tense nod before bolting out of the RV to confront our intruder with adrenaline-fueled courage. Dwayne launched his spear toward the man while I swung the stake at his legs with all the strength I could muster. Yelping in pain, he crumpled momentarily before turning those hollow, hate-filled eyes upon us. That striking gaze seared through me like an icy blade. In that instant I knew that whatever happened next wouldn't be like any previous camping trip, one that Duane and I would joke about when reminiscing together years from now. The tide of terror had risen too high. Whatever the outcome, this was an experience whose horror would follow me through life like an ominous shadow. As the man glared at us, we knew we had to call for help. We couldn't confront him ourselves and it seemed like there was no getting away from him. I glanced at Duane and nodded, signaling that he should find a phone. Maybe the landline in the RV would work where our cell phones failed. Duane hurried back into the RV while I tried to keep an eye on the intruder. The man continued to scowl at us and shifted his weight as if preparing for another attack. Suddenly, the man charged toward me, wielding one of his crude bladed tools. I stumbled backward, trying to avoid his twisted metal and haphazard swings. Luckily, I managed to dodge most of them, but one swing grazed my arm, tearing through my shirt and into my skin. Blood trickled down my arm, painting streaks of red onto my clothes. From the corner of my eye, I saw Duane emerge from the RV with a portable radio in hand. There was no working landline. He fumbled with its dials in a panic. The man advanced on me again, his expression a mixture of fury and sadism that sent shivers down my spine. He lunged toward me with his blade, aiming for my chest. But just as he was about to strike home, Duane slammed into him using his body weight to push him off balance. I stumbled away from them as they crashed together onto the ground. Duane's radio squawked static as he wrestled to keep it free from their struggle. He managed to press an emergency button on its side before grappling with our assailant's hands that were now reaching for his throat. Their fight raged on, each man growing more desperate than the last their faces red with effort and sweat streaming down their brows. They rolled near one of the still-hot fire pits we'd used earlier to cook our dinner, scattering wood and embers across the ground. A sudden snap of a branch under their weight sent flickering flames towards the gasoline we'd left nearby. It ignited the canister with an explosive force, startling all three of us. The intruder, dazed and confused by the explosion, released Duane and staggered back. At that moment, a police siren wailed in the distance. Help was coming. Seizing his chance, Duane tackled the man again, wrestling him to the ground. Though exhausted, he gave every ounce of strength to hold him there. 
As the sirens drew closer, I peered at the man's twisted face. What drove him to this? Why had he targeted us? We may never know for sure. Minutes later, multiple police cars roared into our makeshift campsite. Officers stormed out, guns drawn as they approached our scene. Duane stepped back weakly as they handcuffed the intruder and helped me to my feet. Are you both all right? One officer asked us. We nodded silently, not all right but alive. The intruder's motives remained a mystery long after we provided our testimonies and eventually walked free. It took some time before life returned to normal, or as normal as it could be after such an experience. Years later, during one of our more recent camping trips, Duane and I sat together near a crackling fire as dusk settled around us. Though we rarely spoke about that night anymore, it was something we wanted to forget this time felt different. As if we needed closure. Duane looked over at me with solemn eyes and just said one simple word. Survivors. That was all we needed. That one word summarized our entire shared ordeal. We both knew that those haunting memories would follow us forever. But we also knew that they were a testament to our resilience, a reminder that we had confronted the unthinkable and come out stronger on the other side. It was a humid afternoon, the kind where sweat forms on your forehead no matter what you do. I've always struggled with humidity and the uncomfortable feeling that comes along with it. It makes my police uniform stick to me like glue, and I can't help but grumble about it on days like these. As I patrolled the outskirts of our quaint, small town, I couldn't help but reminisce on the days when the hardest decision I had to make was whether to use a yellow or blue crayon in my coloring book. Life was much simpler then. My radio crackled as dispatch called me with a report from Gunther McQuaid regarding something unusual happening at his small farm just outside town limits. The man had a notorious reputation for exaggeration and drama, so I didn't feel any immediate sense of urgency. So what is it now? I groaned into the radio. Gunther's claiming alien abduction again? No, this time it's different, came the reply from dispatch. He says there's something wrong with his livestock, missing or dismembered or something. I made my way to Gunther's farm, which took a good twenty minutes, giving me enough time to come up with all kinds of outlandish scenarios in my head. What if this was an elaborate prank by some kids from high school? Or maybe Gunther had become involved in some shady business he shouldn't have. When I finally arrived, I felt a mixture of irritation at the humidity and dread for what I might find. Gunther, a disheveled man in his late fifties with gray stubble covering his face, looked like he'd seen better days. Officer Sanders... He called out between ragged breaths as he limped toward me. Something tore up my sheep. You gotta see it. He led me to his barn, where he usually kept the livestock. My boots sloshed through the damp grass as we approached, muttering sarcastic comments along the way. Surely, I'd find nothing more than a raccoon problem or maybe a wild dog. The barn door creaked open, and the stench of blood and decay hit me like a train. I strained to keep my composure as I scanned the gruesome scene before me. Multiple sheep had been slaughtered in not just an animal attack but an unreasonably violent one. Um, is there anyone else you might have angered recently, Gunther? I asked, trying to fit this horror story into any logical explanation. No, he replied frantically. Just this morning, everything was fine. It's not human, I'm telling you. 
My mind raced as I grappled with what could have caused this horrifying display. My gut told me it couldn't be human, but the only other plausible explanations were far too absurd to entertain. Despite myself, my attention drifted to the dense woods at the edge of Gunther's property. As night descended upon us with the swiftness only true darkness can bring, we continued our search for answers among the gore-strewn barn and in the shadow of those eerie woods. Each minute dragged on painfully, fear and reality warring within me as we all tried to come to terms with our vastly altered worldviews. I found myself walking silently toward those woods, which now seemed less benign and more sinister by the hour. We thought we knew what lurked in these forests. Bears, raccoons, deer. Creatures with logical patterns and motives that could be predicted by even an average person like myself. And then it hit me like a bullet. Whatever this was, this wasn't your average creature from local legends. It was something entirely different, terrifyingly cunning and ruthless in its destruction. I should have called for backup or even informed dispatch of my suspicions. I hesitated, realizing the gravity of the situation and the potential danger I was in. If this truly was some unknown, formidable creature, confronting it alone would be foolish, especially without a proper plan. Instead of calling for backup, I decided to seek advice from old man Jenkins, a reclusive town resident who knew more about local folklore than anyone else. When I arrived at his ramshackle home, the door creaked open before I could knock. Old man Jenkins stared at me with piercing eyes. I heard what happened at Gunther's, he said in a gravelly voice. Can you help me understand what we're dealing with? I asked. After gulping down his hesitation, Jenkins invited me in. He led me to a room filled with old books and scrolls. He began rummaging through stacks of papers and finally handed me an ancient-looking document. Here, he said, this might provide some insight. As I read it aloud, my blood turned cold. The text described a creature called Rabawar, a malevolent and intelligent being that terrorizes isolated villages. It seemed preposterous, but the accounts of its attacks lined up eerily well with the brutal scene at Gunther's barn. Though Jenkins refused to elaborate on how he came across this information, he advised using caution when dealing with Rabawar and promised to help devise a plan against it. I knew that my colleagues wouldn't take these claims seriously. However, despite the lack of concrete evidence and the realization that I could lose my job by abandoning protocol, I decided to trust Jenkins and return to Gunther's farm without informing dispatch. As darkness settled around us on our way back to the farm, an unnerving silence replaced the usual nocturnal sounds. Upon arriving, we found Gunther near his barn, looking as pale as death itself. What happened? I demanded. Gunther whimpered, pointing to the now crippled fence surrounding his remaining livestock. Broken bones and torn flesh lay strewn about among the animal's mangled remains. We agreed to wait silently near the farm, setting up a stakeout. Our breaths were shallow, and our tension palpable as we stayed vigilant through the night. Just as dawn approached, we heard an unearthly scream emanate from the woods. The air was electric with dread. This was no animal of this world. Followed a deafening silence before our ears were assaulted by blood-curdling wails and thundering footsteps. The suspense was torture yet we endured. Rabawar refused to reveal itself, remaining just out of sight at the roots of our deepest fears. As the sun rose, I realized that we had reached an impasse. 
We could neither call for help without being laughed out of town nor devise any plan without directly engaging this elusive tormentor, but none of us dared venture into those forsaken woods. Emotionally drained, physically exhausted, and mentally frayed, we reached a terrifying understanding. Gunther's farm was no longer safe, and Rabawar would not be defeated easily. We had no choice but to leave. In a shroud of silence and defeat, we abandoned Gunther's land with heavy hearts. With each step away from that cursed place, our memories of those horrifying events grew hazy. Yet one thing stayed clear. There are certain evils in this world that cannot be faced head-on, some lurking in places beyond our mind's reach and others hiding among us in plain sight. We could only hope to survive while knowing Rabawar existed undefeated, stalking beyond the shadows where ordinary men refused to look. As time progressed, whispers of the creature spread across town, each person telling their own version of events with wide-eyed horror, some making it more sinister than it already was, while others dismissed it as just another grim fable. But we... The silent few who bore witness to the atrocities committed by Rabawar were forced to grapple with the unbearable truth. There exist horrors from beyond our understanding that refuse to yield and will always linger at the edge of reality, leaving a lasting shiver of fear in their wake. As I strapped on my hiking boots and adjusted my hat, I couldn't believe how lucky I was to get a weekend free to explore Mount Shasta. It's been a lifelong dream of mine since childhood, and now I finally got the chance. Little did I know just how much this camping trip would impact me for many years to come. I set off early in the morning, with my backpack stocked full of food, two water bottles, a tent, and other essentials. As the sun rose higher in the sky, casting warm rays onto my pale skin, I reveled in the natural beauty of the environment around me. As much as I loved living in a city, nothing could compare to the feeling of freedom that accompanies nature. At one point, I slowed down to quench my thirst beside what seemed like an ordinary stream looked more like liquid gold in the sun rays. I chuckled at my own corny thought, then glanced up as something caught my eye on the other side of the water. There were odd tracks on the ground, much larger than anything I had seen before. My curiosity was piqued, but knowing that wild animals inhabit these parts, I shook off the feeling and continued with my hike. It was nearing dusk when I finally arrived at an ideal location to pitch up for the night a small clearing surrounded by tall trees offering cover from potential storms. After assembling my tent and starting a small campfire to keep warm and ward off any unwanted visitors, I leaned back against the log and took out a sandwich to eat in peace. Feeling satisfied after eating my meal, I couldn't help but notice how quiet and almost eerie my surroundings had become. The birds that had been chirping without pause during my hike appeared to be missing altogether. An unsettling silence replaced them that left me feeling rather unnerved. Suddenly, there was a loud snapping sound nearby. My heart raced as adrenaline coursed through my veins. I stood up cautiously, peering into the darkness my imagination running wild with thoughts of bears or mountain lions that could be stalking me. As I gripped my Swiss army knife for protection in a shaky hand, another snap echoed through the trees. Who's there? I called out nervously. No response came, but a moment later, I saw something in the darkness not too far from my campsite. The moon provided just enough light for me to see a figure of what appeared to be an unusually large humanoid covered in hair. My mind couldn't comprehend what it was seeing. I blinked, 
hoping that it was just a trick of the light or the result of my dehydration from today's hike. The creature approached closer, and I could now see its face, ape-like and menacing, with eyes that seemed to peer straight through me. Panic crept through me as its mouth stretched into a sinister smile, displaying enormous teeth that threatened to rip me apart any moment. Rooted in place by terror and dread, I suddenly felt another presence nearby and turned my head towards it on instinct. All along the tree line, many more of these creatures were revealed in the moonlight, each with their sinister expressions staring directly at me. I wanted to run away as fast as possible or call for help on my phone. But even if I found signal in this remote location, who would come to my rescue before these horrendous beings closed in on me? Realizing the imminent danger I was in, and with no other options, I mustered all the courage and strength I had to sprint in the opposite direction from these creatures. My footsteps pounded against the forest floor, desperately trying to put as much distance between me and my pursuers as possible. The creatures didn't hesitate to chase me. Hearing their relentless grunts, growls, and the breaking of branches behind me only fueled my panic. I glanced at my phone momentarily, considering calling for help, but remembered that there was no signal in this remote location. I continued to run blindly through the dark forest until I stumbled over a tree root and crashed onto the ground. Pain immediately shot up through my leg, making it impossible to stand up. The prospect of becoming a victim for these inexplicable humanoid beings terrified me even more. The menacing creatures began to surround me, slowly advancing. It was clear that they were making their move. They bore no resemblance to any animal or human that I had ever seen before, a sight that filled me with pure terror. Suddenly a loud, blood-curdling scream tore through the night, an unmistakably human scream. The creatures abruptly stopped advancing toward me and turned their attention toward the source of the noise. In a moment of utter dread-filled confusion, I realized that they were not alone in this forest. Seizing my chance to escape while the creatures were distracted, I managed to crawl away silently into some nearby dense shrubbery without alarming them. Pain radiated through my injured leg as I dared not make a sound or move any further. From my hiding place, I witnessed two more figures emerging into view, all too close for comfort, clearly another hiker and her camping companion. Panic welled up inside me as I comprehended their impending doom. The horrifying realization settled heavily on my shoulders. I couldn't help them without risking my own life in an effective death sentence. As the colossal creatures moved toward the two new individuals with chilling efficiency, I recognized the somber truth that someone surely would not survive this night. Even though my better judgment warned against staying any longer in this perilous environment, Guilt and concern for the other hikers shackled me to my hiding spot. Trembling, I watched their futile attempts to fend off the creatures turned predators as they simultaneously screeched for help and fought a losing battle. In an instant, one of the creatures managed to pounce on the hiker's companion, tearing at his flesh and devouring him hungrily while he screamed in agony. Blood stained the ground a vile reminder of the gruesome events that had unfolded. With renewed urgency, driven partly by panic and fueled by survivor's guilt, I decided to take advantage of this last distraction and crawl away to find a more secure hiding place. I spent what felt like hours slowly moving through the dark forest, away from that horrendous scene. Tiredness threatened to overcome me, but fear kept propelling me forward. Eventually, I found a natural alcove concealed by a dense thicket. It wasn't much, but seemed like a safe enough place to take refuge for the night. Surrounded by darkness and haunted by every sound in the vicinity, I remained vigilant throughout the night. 
Thoughts about those terrifying beings feasting on their victims made it impossible for sleep to claim me. Both guilt over my inability to help them and gratitude for being alive overwhelmed me in equal measure. As dawn finally broke and daylight crept through the trees, I carefully moved from my hiding place. My injured leg protested every movement, but it couldn't stop me from making my way back towards civilization. Leaving behind that sinister nightmare and joining others who had once enjoyed nature without fear was all that mattered now, alongside seeking help for my injuries. The horrific ordeals of those who didn't survive this night of terror would forever be etched in my memory, a grim reminder that the world is not always a safe or predictable place. I was taking a much-needed break from the long hauls on the road as a truck driver. My buddy Lee and I had stopped at Big Bob's truck stop just outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. I felt exhausted but relieved after getting the chance to stretch my legs and finally eat something other than stale gas station hot dogs. The fluorescent lights flickered annoyingly, but it was better than the stuffy confines of the truck. Lee had a knack for lightening the mood, even in the most ordinary of situations. As we sat down for dinner at the adjacent diner, he cracked a joke about the low-grade meatloaf in front of us looking suspiciously like roadkill from our previous stop. We shared a laugh over this particular quirk of our work life. Nothing escaped him. The waitress who served us had overheard Lee's comment and said, You guys are truck drivers, right? Be careful on your route tonight. There have been some gruesome accidents recently involving truckers. What kind of accidents? Lee asked, intrigued. A few truckers have been found slaughtered in their sleeping cabs. She explained with an uneasy expression. No one knows what's happening or who's doing it, but it's pretty horrific. Noted, Lee replied solemnly, acknowledging the seriousness of her warning. We finished our meal and I couldn't help but cast a glance at another driver nearby. He seemed to be traveling solo but didn't look any more dangerous than an average trucker you'd meet in diners like this one. His eyes never left his plate though, seeming to prefer solitude over small talk. As we got back on the road, I couldn't shake the uneasiness from hearing about those recent incidents. My hands gripped the wheel tighter than usual as we continued our drive into the night. It wasn't long before fatigue started to set in again, and we decided it was time to rest. We pulled into one of those makeshift rest stops along the side of the highway, hoping for a few hours of undisturbed sleep. I had this knot in my stomach preventing me from getting comfortable in my cramped sleeping quarters. Suddenly... The air felt tense and suffocating, accompanied by unnatural silence. The faint wisps of fog outside in the night creeped closer and closer to the truck as if it was closing in on us. I tried to convince myself that it was just nerves getting the better of me and attempted to slip into sleep. Late into the night, something jolted me awake. A loud bang echoed through our cabin. Lee, still asleep beside me, hadn't felt anything. But then I heard scraping noises outside our truck, metal against metal, ice-cold shivers running down my spine. Heart racing, I peered out of the window next to my bunk and saw that the fog hung heavy around us, seemingly swallowing everything beyond our immediate vicinity. Suddenly, a shadowy figure darted behind another parked truck in the distance. The guy from the diner. Panic set in as I saw him brandishing a large weapon, a machete or cleaver, glinting with malice. Lee! Wake up! I whispered urgently as I shook him back to consciousness. That guy from Big Bob's, he's here, and he's got a freaking machete. 
For a moment Lee looked disoriented but quickly shifted gears as he realized what was happening. Quick, we need to call the police, I whispered urgently. We pulled out his phone and dialed 911 while we both tried to keep our voices down. It seemed crucial that we not draw any unwanted attention our way. Hello, yes, we need help. We're at a rest stop off I-75 and there's a man with a machete stalking us. He's already attacked another truck. Please send help quickly. Lee whispered into the phone, giving more details about our location. We didn't have time to spare. Lee grabbed our emergency flare from the glove compartment and cautiously opened the truck door. Checking around for any sign of danger, he stepped out of the truck determined to alert other truckers of their impending danger. He managed to light the flare and waved it around without allowing its light to directly shine on him or our truck. Startled by the sudden light, some drivers emerged from their vehicles, trying to figure out what was going on. The police sirens began in the distance. Our hope was that they would make it quickly. That hope dwindled as the man with the machete with one violent swing, attacked one of the drivers who had come to see what was happening. The man let out a blood-curdling scream before collapsing in a heap on the ground. I couldn't just stand idly by and watch innocent people being harmed. I picked up my CB radio and started broadcasting over any open channels I could find, even though I shouldn't contact anyone without authorization in panic situations like this one but lives were at stake. Danger at rest stop off of I-75. There's a man with a machete. Get back in your trucks and lock your doors. People scrambled to their vehicles seeking safety as the attacker began to slash through anything standing in his path. His movements were deliberate and calculated but also had an unnerving chaotic edge. His face was partially obscured by a bandana but his eyes, narrow, cold, and full of unchecked rage, sent shivers down my spine. The police cars finally arrived on the scene surrounding him. Officers took positions behind their car doors, pointing their guns directly at the attacker. Drop your weapon! One of them demanded through the loudspeaker. He responded by attacking another trucker, slashing through the air with his weapon. The police officers opened fire multiple times, all trying to bring him down without anyone else being in danger. Finally, he fell to the ground bleeding profusely. The police cautiously moved in, ensuring his incapacitation before dropping their guard. Miraculously no one had been killed, though two truckers were gravely injured and rushed to nearby hospitals. We were questioned by detectives giving every piece of information we could recall about the man with the machete, and thanked for our efforts in warning others. In the aftermath of that night, I couldn't help but think about that quiet man at Big Bob's diner who carried a hidden darkness within him, a darkness he unleashed on unsuspecting truck drivers on that foggy night at the rest stop. It was a stark reminder that evil can lurk in unsuspecting places and that we can never be too prepared or vigilant to protect ourselves and those around us. The moon loomed high in the sky as I idled my big rig at a lonely truck stop on the outskirts of Tucson, Arizona. My name is Roger Wilkins, and I've been driving trucks cross-country for over a decade. In all my years on the road, I've encountered countless strange people and unusual experiences. But none could ever compare to the gruesome events that took place that fateful night. As I sat there, adjusting the knobs on my CB radio, a man with a bushy beard and ragged clothes approached my cab window. He introduced himself as Terry O'Connor and explained that his car had broken down just down the road. Ordinarily, I would be hesitant to help a stranger at night, 
but Terry's friendly demeanor put me at ease. Deciding to offer him some assistance, I grabbed my toolbox from behind the seat. Together, Terry and I walked along the side of the highway toward his vehicle. Along the way, Terry made some bad puns that cracked me up, saying things like, I guess you could say I'm having a lug nutty night. We continued chatting and laughing despite what was to come. Reaching Terry's car, we noticed streaks of what seemed like blood on the hood. It turned out to be oil mixed with radiator fluid, a possible sign of engine failure. As we pried open the hood to investigate further, a foul stench wafted out, unbearable. We came across remains that hinted at some unspeakable horror. Bloody rags covered in what looked like human teeth were scattered among the engine parts. We were speechless. Unable to move or whisper any rational explanation for what lay before us. When we finally found our voices again, we both agreed not to report our gruesome discovery for fear of falling under suspicion ourselves. As we walked back toward my truck, discussing what we had seen, I noticed Terry's hands were shaking uncontrollably. He must have felt my gaze because he stammered an explanation. I was in a bar fight a couple of days ago, and my hands haven't stopped shaking since. Doctors said it's just temporary. I hope they're right. Once we arrived at my truck, we heard the faint sound of footsteps approaching from the pitch-black darkness that enveloped the road. As the figure drew closer, we could discern a silhouette of a man wearing a long raincoat with a chilling grin plastered across his face. He came closer and closer, his sinister smile widening with every step. That's when Terry and I both knew we were in grave danger. Panic set in as we scrambled into my truck to escape this nightmare. I fumbled with the keys, my hands shaking more than just from nerves now, the adrenaline coursing through my veins. With a screech of tires, we peeled out of the truck stop leaving the man in the raincoat far behind. My heart pounded against my chest while cold sweat drenched my skin, but our ordeal wasn't over yet. As we sped along the desolate highway, headlights appeared in our rearview mirror. The vehicle veered erratically, narrowly avoiding other traffic on the road as it pursued us at breakneck speed. Terry shouted hoarsely over the roar of my engine. That's him. That psycho is chasing us. Our world became one endless chase scene as we tried to outrun our tormentor through the night, barreling down highways and twisting rural roads at incredibly dangerous speeds. Our hearts pounding, Terry and I continued to race down the desolate highway with our mysterious pursuer still following closely. Each turn and curve on the road seemed to stretch the tension further, like a rubber band approaching its breaking point. Our options were limited, and we couldn't risk attracting more attention by involving the authorities, given our earlier discovery at the truck stop. Terry suddenly suggested we take a detour into an obscure overgrown path to try and evade our pursuer. Though hesitant, I agreed it was our best chance. As we maneuvered through the narrow dirt road, branches scraped against the truck's sides while we peered anxiously behind us. The headlights from our pursuer had vanished momentarily but soon after reappeared, closing in on us faster than before. A gut-wrenching scream shattered the silence another victim of this relentless madman. The realization hit that he had followed us onto the dirt path and claimed another life. Unable to bury his face in his hands like he wanted to do since they were busy holding his shaking fists gripped at his lap, Terry just stared blankly at the floor of the truck. I accelerated further, navigating through various twists and turns until a sudden dead end presented itself. A quick U-turn was needed, a moment that would cost us dearly as our pursuer caught up. In a final desperate attempt to escape, I floored the accelerator and drove towards a thick dilapidated fence in hopes of breaking through it. 
The vehicle slammed into it with tremendous force. Splintering wooden panels flew everywhere as it shattered under impact, allowing us just enough space to continue through what appeared to be a construction site, abandoned for years. The maniac tailing us mirrored our every move. His menacing grin haunted me as I barely maintained control of my vehicle under such stressful conditions. It felt like an unrelenting game of cat and mouse stretched beyond any reasonable limit. As we sped through the construction site, I suddenly saw an opportunity. A large, unstable-looking crane towered in the distance. An opportunity for a risky maneuver that could potentially put an end to the chase once and for all. I frantically gave Terry a brief summary of my plan and instructed him to brace himself. Driving at full speed towards the crane, I veered off at the last moment, narrowly avoiding a disastrous collision. Our sinister pursuer was not as fortunate. His car slammed into the base of the crane with devastating force, causing the entire structure to collapse upon him and his vehicle in a cacophony of twisted metal and debris. Terry and I exchanged looks of sheer disbelief before releasing simultaneous sighs of relief. Our ordeal, at least for now, seemed to be over. We exited the truck and cautiously approached the mangled remains of our pursuer's vehicle. Amidst the wreckage, we could make out the man in his raincoat, now lifeless with his chilling grin extinguished forever. A day went by then too, with no sign of further disturbance or retribution. The nightmares remained vivid but began to slowly diminish as each day passed. The chilling memories, though never forgotten, began to fade as well. Though we would always feel guilt for our decision not to report our initial discovery at the truck stop, to this day, we cannot help but feel grateful that our lives had been spared by this unexpected turn of events, an extraordinary result born from unthinkable circumstances. As time moved forward, Terry's shaking hands gradually calmed down, just like his life along with mine returned to some semblance of normalcy. Those who had fallen victim to this horrifying individual were remembered every day, not just by us but others impacted by his atrocities. My love for hiking and nature led me to become a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service. Whenever I wasn't working, I'd spend hours exploring the secluded areas of my assigned park in Aspen Grove, Utah. Up till now, my life had been fairly uneventful. One day as I embarked on one of my routine patrols, I stumbled upon a peculiar scene, a campsite, seemingly abandoned in haste. I called out, hoping to find someone nearby. Maybe they had just temporarily wandered away to gather firewood or something. Despite my efforts, there was no response. As I continued investigating the campsite, it was hard for me to shake the feeling of unease that washed over me. It wasn't something I could easily explain. After years of working in this environment, you learn to trust your instincts. Keeping with protocol, I reported my findings to base and received orders to stay put until backup arrived. While awaiting their arrival, I noticed an unusual pattern in the dirt near the tent's entrance. It looked like large scratch marks leading off into the woods on a scuffed path. A part of me wanted to follow those marks, but I knew better than to venture alone. Soon enough, my co-worker Steve Harrington arrived at the scene via an all-terrain vehicle. He shared his experience of finding a similar-looking campsite just a few weeks back. We were both puzzled and concerned about these happenings' eerie similarities. As we discussed our theories and further inspected the area together, we remained vigilant. We couldn't ignore the strange marks in the dirt any longer. With backup now present, 
Steve and I began cautiously following the trail of scratch marks into the woods. This decision felt necessary as part of our duty to ensure neither humans nor animals were injured or in danger. The trail led us through some harsh terrain veering off from any marked hiking paths. Ordinary tourists would rarely venture this deep into the forest. As we delved further into the trees, a sinking feeling started to emerge inside me. It felt as if we were being watched. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream ripped through the air. It sounded just feet away and my heart hammered in my chest as Steve and I exchanged worried glances. Neither of us knew what would await us but grasping our firearms at our side, we prepared for whatever may come. We ventured further in the direction of the scream, bracing ourselves for anything. Another scream erupted through the air. This one sounded closer than before. Remaining vigilant and focused on the task at hand, we continued forward. A dense fog began to settle around us, making visibility increasingly difficult. Frantically searching for the source of the screams, I noticed a barely perceptible movement in the distance. My heart raced faster as I struggled to make out any discernible features of whatever was lurking there. As the figure drew closer and came into focus, I could barely believe what I was seeing an impossibly tall, hunchbacked figure with elongated limbs that appeared almost skeletal in nature. Its skin appeared gray and weathered like old tree bark. Its face was contorted in an expression of pure agony. Steve and I aimed our firearms at this unnerving creature, but before either of us could attempt any form of communication or engagement, the creature lunged straight for us. Reacting instinctively, we both fired our weapons in self-defense, with no discernible effect on the advancing beast. Our minds raced as we racked our brains for a viable plan of action. The necessity to call for help became abundantly apparent, and I quickly radioed in our situation, urgently requesting immediate assistance from our fellow officers. With no time to waste and no viable means of fighting back, Steve and I executed the logical move, run. As we sprinted through the dense fog and rugged terrain evading this monstrous beast, both of us were fueled by adrenaline and an overwhelming desire to survive the pursuit. Steve managed to maintain contact with our fellow officers through radio updates as we navigated the chaotic chase. During moments when it seemed that the creature would catch up to us, I caught glimpses of its grotesque features, all razor-sharp teeth and eyes devoid of pupils or redness. These terrifying physical attributes solidified in my mind just how dire our situation was. The collective sound of barked orders, sprinting footsteps, and snapping twigs accompanied by erratic gunfire reverberated through the once quiet forest. Our colleagues fought bravely against this nightmarish antagonist while trying to buy us precious time to escape. Sadly, though, that adversary proved overwhelming for many of them. We dove behind makeshift barricades made from downed trees amidst all the chaos as backups scrambled to subdue the vicious attacker. Despite Steve's repeated protests that they needed to retreat too, Several brave souls continued their efforts until they ultimately succumbed to the creature's relentless assault. Battered and bloodied yet still standing, Steve and I eventually managed to make a slow escape with minimal cover from a rapidly dwindling force. The sounds of guttural growls and frenzied movement began to fade as we continued our painful retreat. Once it seemed we were at a safe distance from the creature, Steve and I stumbled through the fog in search of possible survivors. As we trudged deeper into what seemed like an endlessly stretching forest, the sounds of snapping twigs and hushed whispers filled the eerily quiet air. Just beyond a shroud of dense fog, we found two fellow officers, both severely injured but alive. With teamwork and grit, we helped them to their feet and commenced our trek back to the campsite. 
Struggling under the palpable weight of exhaustion and bone-deep fear, we pressed forward in agonizing silence. Upon reaching the relative safety of our campsite, I once again called for help, this time for emergency medical assistance. The desperate journey through that forest left us collectively scarred, physically, mentally, and emotionally. As paramedics flooded the area to tend to those still clinging to life, thoughts turned to our fallen co-workers who had given their lives in an attempt to save ours. Within moments of reflection, it became apparent that no investigation or revenge-seeking could ever make sense of or justify the heinous crimes committed by the monstrous assailant that had targeted us. Through sheer fortune and determination to survive, Steve and I had managed to escape with our lives while others hadn't been so lucky. With heavy hearts but nerves steeled by pain and loss, we swore a solemn vow. Never would we venture into that forsaken place again where unspeakable horrors dared prey upon humanity. As life tiptoed towards something like normalcy in the days following that gruesome encounter, memories of those lost weighed heavily upon us all. We knew that there was no way to adequately convey our gratitude to those who sacrificed their lives for ours. However, it was evident that remembrance was a powerful force. By carrying them with us in our thoughts and in our work, we could continue to honor their memory and ensure that their sacrifices would never be forgotten. It all began on a sweltering afternoon like any other. Trudging through the dense, untamed forest under the weight of my gear, and the seemingly ever-increasing humidity, I did my best to stay cool and keep moving. My name is Owen Murphy, a search and rescue officer for the U.S. Forest Service. Work has always been an outlet for me, a way to clear my mind and escape into nature. My boots sank into the damp earth with each step as I navigated around roots and rocks. My co-workers, Arya and Xander, were close behind, chatting about their weekend plans. Having an uncommon kinship among teammates in our line of work was something we all cherished. As we moved further into the thick canopy of greenery that enveloped us, I noticed an eerie silence gradually overcoming the sounds of chirping birds and rustling leaves. It was as if we had breached an invisible boundary, ushering us into an uncharted realm. The sun began its descent below the horizon as we pressed on. It wasn't long before our group stumbled upon something that sent chills racing through our veins. There, lying in front of us on our path through the wilderness, was a shredded backpack and scattered belongings, a cracked phone, torn clothes, and debris as if there'd been some kind of violent struggle. A pool of dried blood stained the soil a dark crimson. Arya stifled a gasp as Xander pulled out his walkie-talkie to radio for help, but there was no response. We scanned the area for any signs of survivors but found nothing, not even footprints that might lead us to any human presence. As darkness fell upon us like a shroud, our flashlight beams cut through shadows cast by towering trees above us. We needed to find shelter for the night before resuming our search. Muffled sounds emanated from deeper within the forest. None of us dared to admit what we were all thinking. This was no ordinary rescue mission. We found a small cave to take refuge in and tried to make contact with our base again, but it was futile. We could see that Arya was trying her best to hold herself together, her pale face revealing the terror she felt inside. Xander cracked a stupid joke about sleeping in caves, garnering some strained laughter from us all. I considered confessing how unsettled I was by this whole ordeal, but it wasn't going to do us any good. Strength in numbers, that's what we needed. As the night wore on, and sleep eluded me, I couldn't stop myself from replaying the horrific scene in my head. 
The blood, the discarded phone, the signs of a fierce confrontation, it all seemed to point towards some unknown predator. Hours later, as dawn broke through the trees that cradled us in their menacing branches, we ventured back out into the wilderness, no closer to answers or potential survivors than we'd been before. It wasn't until we entered a clearing within the heart of the forest that reality became far more horrifying than any of us could have imagined. In front of us stood a monstrosity, a gnarled figure with long limbs and grotesque features that crawled along the ground like an ominous shadow from forgotten folklore. Time seemed suspended as we locked eyes with its malicious glare, paralyzed by abject fear. Our instincts finally managed to push through our days as Xander and I reached for our firearms in unison, firing a few warning shots into the air while simultaneously scanning for an escape route. The creature hissed as it lunged toward us with a speed and agility we couldn't comprehend. Its muscular, twisted frame seemed both human and beast-like. Long, sharp claws extended from its fingers, while dark, coarse hair covered its body. It appeared both hungry and determined, its eyes holding a ferocity suggesting an insatiable need to destroy anything in its path. Arya screamed as the monstrous creature advanced on us, its putrid breath revealing a mouth full of jagged and discolored teeth. Xander grabbed Arya's hand and we all sprinted back into the dense forest, hoping against hope we could outpace this vile creation. Adrenaline courses through my veins as I push myself on, stumbling over roots and uneven terrain in my blind panic. The thing is relentless, the sound of snapping branches and labored breathing closing in on us. Xander's voice breaks through the chaos, shouting for everyone to split up in an attempt to confuse our pursuer. Despite our lack of a better plan, we do as he says. Arya darts off to the left while Xander and I veer off in separate directions. My legs feel like jelly as my surroundings blur together. I don't dare look back. I know if I falter or lose even a second of precious time, death will greet me with open arms. It's agonizing to feel so utterly helpless. You can't really fight or reason with such a being. Only hope that you'll outrun it or that it loses interest in your trail. Eventually, the sounds of pursuit fade away into the distant background. I find my way back to where we were originally separated. No signs of Xander or Arya yet. My hands fumble with my walkie-talkie as I attempt to contact them without alerting the creature looming somewhere nearby. Keeping my voice barely above a whisper, I share my location and plead for updates on their well-being. Xander's voice reaches my ears first, shaky but alive, as he explains he's managed to elude the creature for now. Arya, on the other hand, remain silent. Frustration and terror well up inside me. I can't bear to lose Arya, or anyone else for that matter. Desperate to find her, I ignore the primal instinct telling me to flee and regroup. There's no guarantee she'll get away as Xander and I have. My steps quicken in search of my lost friend, despite knowing I'm putting myself in harm's way. Before long, my heart sinks as I come across a gruesome scene. Arya lies on the ground, her body twisted and bloody from the monster's relentless attack. Tears stream down my face at the sight, she's gone. But before I can truly process this loss, sounds from behind remind me of the imminent danger still at large. In a final desperate effort to escape myself and warn Xander of this tragic development, we coordinate a meeting spot to set down as far from this nightmarish place as possible. As we unite once more, bleary-eyed and clad in despair, we share a mournful silence for our fallen comrade. We leave the forest behind us with heavy hearts, but also with a newfound appreciation for the fragile nature of life. Whatever that creature was will remain a devastating mystery that claimed one too many victims. However, 
We both understand the importance of staying strong in her memory. This horror will not define us or shatter our resolve. Promising to honor Arya and avoid such tragic encounters in the future, we return home defeated but determined never to forget her bravery in the face of darkness. As time marches on, we continue our rescue missions with renewed caution. Still haunted by those grisly memories, it's a small token we hold on to, the knowledge that we must survive and thrive for those that can no longer do so themselves. My name is Declan Riley, and I work as a ranger at a secluded national park in the United States. This terrifying experience happened to me just a couple of weeks ago. The park, with its vast wooded areas and picturesque lakes, was always teeming with wildlife and the occasional adventurous camper, but nothing could have prepared me for the events that soon unfolded. The strange occurrences began on July 15th, when I discovered an odd scene while out on my rounds. Much to my disgust, there were bloodstains smeared across the trail. No bodies or animals were around, but it was evident that something violent had taken place here. Being more confused than alarmed, I decided to continue observing the area carefully in case it was an isolated incident. But as days went by, more disturbing findings appeared throughout the park. Pieces of torn clothing stained with blood, discarded belongings indicating struggle, and strangely positioned branches resembling makeshift messages or symbols. My fellow rangers and I grew increasingly concerned for our safety as well as those who ventured within the park's boundaries. We tried contacting local law enforcement for assistance, but our location's remoteness left us with little luck. Either cell phone signals nor radio frequencies could penetrate this dense wilderness effectively. The tension grew every passing day until one fateful afternoon when I encountered what had been stalking us all along. I had just finished mending a damaged fence near one of the less traveled trails when an unmistakable feeling of being watched washed over me. Slowly turning around, my eyes struggled to process what stood before them. A monstrous creature easily seven feet tall, its body coated with matted fur as dark as the deepest shadows. But its most terrifying feature was its head that of a deer or elk skull with grotesquely large antler-like protrusions branching out from the top. Its hollow eye sockets seemed to pierce through me, sparking a primal sense of fear within my very core. I couldn't fathom how such an abomination could exist in our world, yet there it stood, only a few yards away from me. In that moment, Adrenaline coursed through my veins as I scrambled to reach for the hunting knife at my hip. While I wasn't confident about facing this beast head-on, I knew I had no other choice but to defend myself. As the creature started advancing towards me with ominous purpose, I knew that escape wouldn't be possible in such an open area. However, the thought of my fellow rangers and their well-being drove me to action. Taunting the monster with a shout and a reckless lunge of my knife, I led it on a desperate chase deeper into the woods. The creature pursued relentlessly, its hooves thundering against the forest floor as it closed the gap. But eventually, we reached a narrow ravine teeming with sharp rocks and jagged cliffs. Seeing an opportunity to gain an advantage over my unnatural foe, I clambered my way across the treacherous landscape before stopping at an unstable boulder precariously perched above us. Convinced that this could be my one chance for survival, or at least for delaying this monstrosity long enough for help to arrive, I heaved at the boulder with every ounce of strength I possessed. My efforts were rewarded when it began to wobble dangerously, and finally terminated into a controlled avalanche. As I pushed with all my might, 
the boulder toppled over and began barreling toward the creature. It managed to dodge the falling rocks, but not the massive, unstable boulder that crushed it beneath its weight. I watched as the antler-like protrusion snapped and broke under the pressure, and the creature let out an ear-splitting sound of pain and rage. Exhausted, I looked around but saw no sign of my fellow rangers. I hoped against hope that they had managed to evade the monster and were somewhere safe by now. With no other options in sight, I made my way back to our campsite, retracing my steps as best as I could. Upon reaching the campsite, I found it deserted and eerily quiet. As much as I wanted to call for help, my voice was stolen by fear of attracting more unwanted attention. Desperate for any scrap of information or assistance, I quickly searched our makeshift headquarters for clues about what had happened to Kyle and Sarah. Their gear lay strewn across the ground in disarray, evidence of a hasty escape. I knew I needed to warn them that the creature could return at any moment so with no other choice. Out of desperation, I called their cell phones only to be met with silence on both lines. I began running further into the woods hoping I would find them before it would be too late. Suddenly, I stumbled upon Kyle's lifeless body sprawled across a field with thick claw marks all over him. All yearning for a reunion vanished as terror gripped me anew. The creature had found Sarah before it left in pursuit of me. Whoever this foe was wouldn't stop till it had wiped us all out. I continued searching through the woods amid this grim reality, but found no trace of Sarah until eventually night cloaked everything around me with darkness. Fearful that night would bring about renewed danger but not giving into it, I found a small cave to seek shelter for the night. Huddling in the dark, waiting for morning to come, I couldn't shake the thought of Sarah still out there in the cold darkness, makes my heart race. When daylight broke through the trees, I set out again, obsessively driven while steeling myself against any gruesome discoveries. Finally, as if in answer to my relentless determination, I found her crouching weak but alive and hidden behind a damp bush some way ahead. She told me that she had hidden herself nearby when she saw our pursuer taking Kyle down and that there was no strength left in her to press on. Together we gathered our courage and our remaining wits to make the long trek back to civilization. We were determined not to let this monster terrorize anyone else ever again. While our bodies were bloodied with scratches and bruises from the harsh forest maze, we finally reached a highway barely alive with exhaustion but sheer willpower. Once there, flagging down a trucker who assisted us in calling for help from the ranger station in which we worked. Help arrived quickly, efficient as ever. We informed them about the encounter with antler-skulled creature and how it claimed Kyle's life. After rescue teams aided us in treating our injuries and investigating what had happened, there was no trace left of that bizarre creature or any evidence of its existence apart from Kyle's sadly lifeless body bearing those horrifying marks of foul play. Sometimes during sleepless nights lasting months afterward, I'd think back on that small moment of triumph that saved Sarah and me against this relentless beast only so that I could remind myself that no matter how monstrous some things appear to be some battles are truly worth fighting. The memory of Kyle would live on with Sarah and me until our dying days where we swore an oath to look out for one another so that no other predator would ever get the chance to take the thing most valuable to us, a chance to survive. My name is Ezekiel Farley and I am an arborist. My work mainly involves the maintenance and removal of trees in various places around the United States. 
This terrifying experience happened to me on a secluded job site in the densely forested area of Oregon. The location required special permits for our crew since it was part of a wildlife preserve. That's where I realized that sometimes there are things you just can't explain. Driving my company truck up the rutted dirt road, Anders, my colleague, kept trying to crack jokes in a vain attempt to lighten the mood. Despite his efforts, I couldn't shake an uneasy feeling about this job site. We pulled up to meet with Brandt, another team member who had arrived earlier that day. What took you guys so long? Brandt asked in an annoyed tone. Blame the road if you want. I sighed, rubbing the back of my neck. I'm not an off-road racer. As we started setting up our equipment and discussing our strategies for the tree removals, Anders suddenly looked pale and worried. Guys, he whispered, I found something. We followed Anders to a small clearing in the trees where a disturbing scene unfolded before us. Splintered wood and debris littered the ground surrounding what looked like remnants of a campsite what was left of one, anyway. What happened here? Brandt wondered aloud as we surveyed the chaotic aftermath. Could have been some kind of animal attack. I reluctantly suggested but couldn't quite swallow my own words. The damage seemed too extensive for any ordinary creature. As dusk approached, our first day's progress at this eerie site ended uneventfully but for that unsettling discovery. We decided to stay overnight at the site due to its remote location, bringing forth another tense night spent with our flashlights flickering through darkened trees. The following morning, we resumed our task. But as we delved deeper into the forest, odd and unnerving sounds emanated around us, branches snapping, soft growls echoing through the vegetation. Each time we focused on the noises, they stopped abruptly. At one point, an eerie figure appeared among the trees, too distant to discern any clear features. The only detail my eyes could make out was a large deer-like skull with imposing antlers sprouting from atop a tall humanoid form. It was just standing there, observing us with an unnatural stillness. Neither Anders nor Brandt saw it when I pointed it out. Instead, they chuckled and accused me of trying to spook them further. I couldn't tell if I was relieved or terrified that no one else noticed what I had seen. We continued our work but tensions only grew as the day progressed. The dense foliage coupled with the sounds of our heavy machinery seemed to amplify every potential threat lurking in the shadows. We needed reassurance in our surroundings, so Anders pulled out his radio but found that reception was non-existent. Why is everything getting weirder? He muttered nervously. Our team agreed to finish up the day before night fell and then head back home but that decision proved easier said than done. On our last tree cutting operation, we found ourselves surrounded by the unnerving crunching of footsteps echoing from every direction. This time, each of us heard it, and I saw sheer panic cross both Anders and Brandt's faces. It was then that I knew we were not alone after all. We decided to call for help right away, but with no reception, our options were limited. Let's try to find our way back home while calling the emergency hotline. I suggested, and the others agreed. We moved cautiously through the forest, trying to retrace our steps. The unsettling noises continued, increasing our anxiety. I kept glancing around hoping not to see the skull-faced creature again. Suddenly, a gut-wrenching scream pierced through the air. We turned toward the sound and saw one of our co-workers, Jim, caught in a bear trap. His leg was twisted and bloody, and tears streamed down his face as he cried out in pain. Anders and Brandt rushed to his side, trying to free him from the trap. I yelled into the radio for help, 
knowing it was likely futile but desperate for a connection. Then we heard it. The heavy crunching of footsteps approaching us steadily. My heart pounded as I scanned the forest and saw the terrifying figure closing in on us. The deer-like skull and immense antlers atop a tall humanoid form. Guys! The creature is coming this way! I shouted. Anders waved me over. Help me carry Jim. We can't just leave him here. Together, we lifted him as gently as possible while Brandt provided cover with a tree branch he picked up as a makeshift weapon. As we hobbled along, trying to escape with agonizing slowness due to Jim's injury, I watched in horror as the monstrous creature reached Brandt in what seemed like an instant. Its massive hand shot out and grabbed his neck, lifting him off the ground with ease before crushing his windpipe with an audible snap. I could only scream as we continued frantically carrying Jim away from the scene of carnage. My voice drowned out by Jim's agonized cries and Anders' desperate prayers for survival. It felt like hours before we finally reached the edge of the forest, unsure if the creature was still pursuing us. The sun had set by then, but the full moon provided enough light for us to make out a nearby road. Finally! We made it! Anders panted in relief. Other people were nearby, perhaps attracted by our screams earlier. I collapsed to the ground, shaking with adrenaline. A small crowd had gathered around us, staring at the injured Jim. Please, someone call an ambulance! I pleaded. The onlookers seemed both frightened and concerned and one hurriedly dialed 911. As we waited for assistance, we exchanged glances filled with grief over how different this day could have been if Jim and Brand had been spared or if we'd never entered that godforsaken forest. The paramedics arrived quickly and took Jim away for treatment, keeping us updated on his critical condition. In the meantime, we shared our harrowing story with anyone who would listen. News of our encounter with the creature spread rapidly throughout the community. People gave many differing theories about what it could be, an escaped genetic experiment, or a cryptid from local lore. Ultimately, nobody had definitive answers. Jim survived but remained wheelchair-bound due to complications from his leg injury. Brant's body was found a few days later in the woods after a thorough search by local authorities, but no traces of our nightmarish nemesis were ever discovered, leaving only harrowing memories and unanswered questions scattered across our minds as gruesome reminders of our worst day in the forest. I had never been one for superstition, believing myself to be a man of science and reason. As a researcher employed by the U.S. government, working on top-secret genetic experiments in a hidden facility deep in the heart of the Appalachians, one has to maintain a certain level of skepticism. My colleagues and I were determined to uncover every facet of human genetics to develop life-changing enhancements cures, and possibly even weapons. For security reasons, I can't give you my real name, but just call me Henry Harlow. The facility was well hidden within miles of dense forestation. No roads, no signs, perfect for the extreme confidentiality required by our work. Throughout the day, it was calm and serene. At night, however, things changed. The darkness seemed even more profound than usual, engulfing everything in sight once the sun dipped beneath the horizon. While walking alone through the long corridors late one evening after leaving my lab station at Shift's End, I started whistling an old tune that had been stuck in my head all day. This was typical. Usually, the echo reverberating against the narrow walls calmed my nerves. 
However, this time, as I reached my office intent on retrieving some forgotten files, I became aware of a series of strange thuds. Anxious but rationalizing that it was probably just someone dropping their gear or rustling around in their workstation nearby. After all this facility was filled with people, I picked up the pace till I reached where I assumed the noise originated. The new scientist on our team, Bradford Marks, had his back turned to me as he fumbled with a cabinet he appeared to have trouble closing because he kept glancing around nervously. Chuckling awkwardly under my breath at witnessing my colleague's inability to handle basic household tasks without supervision let alone our projects, when suddenly an alarmingly loud crash reverberated off the concrete walls. Alarmed, I shot a quizzical look at Bradford, who gulped apprehensively. I, uh, I knocked over a box of glass slides by accident, he stammered. Shrugging it off, we moved on and tried not to think about the shattered slides, forsaking them for more pressing concerns. We both hurried back to the office and settled into our respective tasks. With an arduous load overtaking our evenings and expressively heavy-eyed dispositions when morning broke, we were barely aware of time's passing. Encased in my lab station one morning, I heard my assistant Delilah shriek. Startled from my work stupor, I rushed over to her desk to find her as pale as a ghost while she stared down at a gruesome scene before her. On the floor lay a mangled mass of flesh and fur intermingled with stains that streaked across the tiled floor. Averting our eyes from the abhorrent scene, we summoned security to dispose of whatever macabre specimen that was unfortunate enough to penetrate our hidden facility undetected. We need to tighten up around here, said Mitchell Turner, another scientist on our team. While he maintained a cool and collected demeanor on most occasions, it was clear this disturbing incident had affected him. Everyone became antsy after that encounter with wild paranoia coursing through our veins like an infection. Rumors and gossip circulated rampant as an epidemic and mere whispers of something else also here began muting like subtle footsteps in darkened rooms amplified by sheer terror spreading amongst us like wildfire. All too soon came another night shift fraught with even more imminent danger than before when, late one evening from deep within these endless hallways came sounds that defied explanation. Something colossal and lumbering seemed to prowl just mere feet from us beyond where outsight lines illuminated by incongruously bright fluorescent lights adorning the industrial ceiling failed to reach. We all stood utterly paralyzed with fear, unable to move amidst our collective panic, holding our breaths in anticipation for whatever new horror was surely about to unfold. Suddenly it burst forth upon us, an enormous creature the likes of which no person had ever laid eyes on before with gnarled limbs and fearsome, twisted features pulled straight from our most hideous nightmares. Letting out a gut-wrenching bellow that echoed across every inch of the complex, this horrific creature lunged towards us its movements almost unnatural in their grotesque agility. As the enormous creature approached us, its gnarled limbs and twisted features became more visible, and my heart raced. I started to panic, but I didn't want to show my fear in front of my colleagues. Mitchell Turner led the team's retreat, as we all hurried to escape this monstrous being. The atmosphere was thick with tension while we stumbled through the seemingly endless hallways of the facility. Unfortunately, the creature proved faster than us lunging at one of our co-workers, Tom. I couldn't bear to witness the gruesome attack and quickly turned my head away. Though we desperately wanted to call for help, the isolated nature of our facility made this near impossible. The facility's communication only existed within its walls. Our superiors believed keeping our work separate from the outside world added a layer of security. This way, 
yelled Delilah while leading us into a room that contained a large metal door. Inside was a vast space where we could possibly barricade ourselves in and keep the monstrous creature out. Slamming the door shut behind us, Mitchell began to construct a makeshift barricade using tables and chairs found within the room. We all contributed in assembling this barrier, hoping it would provide some protection against this ferocious antagonist. As we worked on strengthening our defenses, Janet couldn't help but cry out with pain and grief. She was Tom's wife and had just lost her partner right in front of her eyes. Mitchell spoke up as he noticed her distress. I'm so sorry for your loss, Janet. Let's stay strong for Tom and find a way to survive this ordeal. With our defenses assembled, we cautiously peered through a small window in the door to check if the creature would eventually leave. Suddenly, it appeared again by the doorway, trying to find an entry point into the room where we sought refuge. The creature became aggressive when it realized there was no way in. It pounded against the door with fury, causing the metal to bend slightly with each forceful impact. Our barricade visibly began to weaken, and fear enveloped us all as it seemed only a matter of time before the creature broke through. We refused to stand there and do nothing. Mitchell and I searched the room for anything we could use as a weapon. We discovered unusual tools, some designed for research purposes but now repurposed in our desperate attempt to protect ourselves. With a plan in place, we used those tools as weapons, set up as traps at specific entry points. If the creature eventually broke through, these traps would be our only line of defense aside from physically attacking it with our makeshift weapons. Everyone prepared themselves for the worst-case scenario, while secretly praying that we wouldn't have to confront this creature in such close quarters again. After hours of continuous pounding, the creature suddenly stopped its barrage against the door. The eerie quiet made us even more fearful. Has it given up or was it planning a new tactic? Soon enough, we heard its footsteps trail away from our location. Mitchell peered through the small window and cautiously confirmed that it had left. We took this opportunity and began making our way out of the facility. As much as we wanted revenge for Tom's brutal demise, it was either productive nor safe for us to stay there and face a battle we knew nothing about. While escaping through one of the side exits, we discovered large scratch marks on the outer walls suggesting that more than one of these creatures had infiltrated our facility. We surmised that they could be part of a larger group propelling their way into other locations as well. Although we lost Tom, we survived through that horrifying ordeal and managed to escape our once-contained facility that had become a nightmare. In memory of Tom, we vowed to regroup outside and eventually find help from law enforcement or military officials who were better equipped to handle this unprecedented threat. As we moved further from the facility, all we could do was to keep moving and hope that these creatures would not pursue us. No matter what ended up happening for us or our world, the memory of this gruesome incident would never leave our souls. My name is Carter Macon, and I'm a forest ranger stationed in the White Mountain National Forest, New Hampshire. It's really hard to find a decent pizza around these parts. Trust me, I've tried. I live in a cozy little cabin tucked away near the outskirts of the forest. The cabin's remote location provides a much-needed escape from the chaos of city life. One particular evening... While enjoying a home-cooked meal and watching my favorite crime show, I received a distressed phone call from my neighbor Amelia, who lived three miles away from me. Something had attacked her livestock. She was frantic, 
and her voice shook as she described the gruesome scene. Shoving my boots on and grabbing my rifle for precautionary measures, I rushed out the door towards Amelia's home. By the time I got there, I found her standing in front of her barn with tears streaming down her cheeks. What happened? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. There in the barn, she stammered, pointing shakily towards the entrance. Bracing myself for what I might find, I cautiously entered the barn. The sight that greeted me nearly made me wretch. The barn was littered with mutilated animal remains, bits of flesh strewn about in disturbing patterns on the dirt floor. The smell was awful too, flatulence mixed with burnt rubber. I reassured Amelia that I would stay on guard while she went back to her house. We exchanged phone numbers and agreed to call each other instantly if we spotted any more suspicious activity. Throughout that night and into the next day, everything remained quiet, a bit too quiet, actually. But that all changed during my patrol near a riverbank two days later when I thoughtlessly cracked a terrible dad joke. Why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. That was when it all went downhill. A guttural growl unexpectedly filled the air around me. It was like nothing I'd ever heard before. Instinctively, I raised my rifle and scanned the area for any possible threats. That was when I saw it, an enormous creature standing on all fours in a clearing about fifty yards away from me. With matted fur, patches of exposed flesh, and elongated limbs, it appeared entirely out of place in its surroundings. Its eyes glowed an unsettling shade of crimson. I tried to steady my breathing as the creature crept closer, its movements unnatural and almost insect-like. My fingers trembled around my rifle's trigger, knowing that even a single misstep could spell doom for me. Stay back! I warned, shouting in a futile attempt to intimidate the monster. But the beast showed no signs of retreat. Instead, it let out a feral snarl and began to charge at me. As the creature charged... I made a split-second decision to run instead of attempting to fight the terrifying beast. I sprinted back towards Amelia's house, hoping she would hear my panicked footsteps and help secure her home. As I reached her front door, I frantically pounded on it, yelling, Amelia! Let me in! It's coming! To my relief, she opened the door immediately and ushered me inside. We locked the door, both of our hearts pounding. What's going on? Amelia asked, breathless. I recounted the encounter with the grotesque creature, trying to convey how dangerous it seemed. Amelia grabbed her phone and called for help. The local police said they would send an officer our way, but it would take them fifteen minutes to arrive. Eyes wide in fear, we both agreed we needed a hiding place until help arrived. We quickly retreated into her basement and locked the door behind us. Minutes later, we heard heavy footsteps approaching Amelia's house. The creature was sniffing out our scent around the perimeter. Thuds and crashes echoed above us as the monster broke windows and tore through doors in search of us. The once quiet basement had become a chamber of dread as we listened to the menacing growls above. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, sirens wailed in the distance and appeared to scare off our unwanted visitor. Multiple car doors slammed shut and stern voices shouted commands above our heads they had arrived at last. No more sounds came from within the house. We assumed that they were investigating what had happened. Amelia cautiously opened the basement door as two officers rushed down to check on us. We were both physically unharmed but emotionally wrecked. We provided as much information about our assailant as possible its appearance and how it had behaved but neither of us could offer any explanation for its origin or motivation. 
Years have passed since that dreadful encounter, but I still remain vigilant. As a professional hunter, I'm no stranger to dangerous situations. But what happened at Amelia's farm and the sheer menace of the creature I encountered that day remains an indelible memory that continues to haunt me. I've resolved never to let my guard down, lest I cross paths with that blood-curdling beast once more. I have one thing for which to be grateful. The incident brought me and Amelia much closer, and we've been inseparable friends ever since. From time to time, rumors circulate about another brutal attack in some remote locale. The hair on my neck stands up each time I hear such news, wondering if it's the same creature from our past. The police officers involved in our case have retired or moved on to other departments, but we can't help remaining in occasional contact, as though an invisible thread connects all who have witnessed the creature's handiwork. Out of respect for them for all of those who have been adversely impacted by this horrifying beast Amelia and I refrain from discussing it gratuitously. In each other's company, we strive to look forward rather than dwelling on the darkness behind us. We've both dedicated ourselves to making our community stronger and safer for those around us. And maybe it's because of this continued collaboration that we're less afraid than before finding solace and strength through numbers, unspoken solidarity with fellow survivors forever marked by an encounter with pure evil incarnate. The day I drove into town for that job interview, the weather was unbelievably mild for Alaska. I pulled into an unassuming parking lot of a small, nondescript office building just off the main road. My scheduled meeting with the hiring manager went surprisingly well. Little did I know that, as the day unfolded, my life would change forever. My name's Lucas Mitchell and I've always been a practical, skeptical kind of guy. The thought of anything supernatural never really bothered me. As I left the interview in high spirits, eager to explore the wooded area nearby before heading home, I couldn't have imagined what lied ahead. Due to my career in forestry management, I often spent time surveying various wooded landscapes in search of potential conservation projects. This day was no exception and I found myself walking deeper and deeper into the vibrant forest that surrounded Mount Sanford. It took me almost two hours to finally reach a remote area near a lake. As I leaned down to examine an overgrown creek bank, a foul smell filled my nose one so acrid it caused my throat to seize up momentarily. Seeking out the source of the odor, I discovered a pile of belongings scattered on the ground, accompanied by footprints indicating that someone had been dragged away from this spot. Thoughts raced through my mind. Could it be a terrible wildlife attack? That stench could there be a decayed body nearby? Concerned for my safety and whoever may have been involved in this confusing scene, something inside me urged me to get into my truck and call for help immediately. Grabbing my phone from my backpack as soon as I slid behind the wheel, no sooner had I dialed 911 when an enormous shape crashed through the trees around me. Although stunned and without a second thought about what procedures were proper in these situations, instinct steered me on to pressing send on the call. Instantly after connecting, I was shouting into the phone, There's someone out here with me. No, not human. A creature. As the colossal beast with glowing eyes swung an enormous arm in my direction, I stammered to the operator my location. The time it took for help to arrive would be fraught with terror and danger, but eventually. The sharp thud against my windshield sent the phone flying from my hands, shattering the glass. This massive humanoid figure stood inches away from me, 
its eerily elongated limbs covered in thick hair somehow even darker than the deepening night around us. It felt like some abhorrent remnant of long-forgotten lore had come to life before my eyes. Then it moved aside just enough for me to catch a glimpse of another truck bearing down towards me, lights flashing and horn blaring. It was as if two colliding worlds teetered on a knife's edge. Here was someone sent to help me trap behind my own windshield, while an unimaginable foe loomed just outside. I already knew these potential rescuers were no match for such a formidable creature that had effortlessly torn through trees and demolished glass mere moments ago. Yet, something about their brave approach filled me with a glimmer of hope that made grasping at straws feel worthwhile. There's a big thing out here. It's going to hurt more people you have got to hurry. I screamed into what was left of my phone as I floored the gas pedal and clumsily guided my truck around both the advancing monster and their doomed vehicle. Sensing my feeble attempt at escape, the beast roared in rage and ensnared one of the now-abandoned trucks with impossible strength that crushed metal like wet cardboard. All warnings forgotten in this twisted game of cat and mouse— I realized that victory was far beyond any strength or power still accessible within me. The more I evaded this nightmare, the more it hungered for my ultimate demise. Having no other choice, I continued to drive as fast as my battered truck would allow, hoping to escape the monstrous beasts pursuing me. My phone long destroyed, I regretted not giving the operator my exact location earlier. It might have hastened the arrival of help. As I navigated the dark forest around me, I caught a glimpse of headlights in the distance. Another vehicle approached perhaps it was help arriving at last. I honked my horn and flashed my own headlights, desperate for anyone's attention. The oncoming vehicle slowed down, its driver clearly noticing my frantic signs of distress. What's going on? They shouted out their window when our vehicles were parallel to each other. There's a huge creature after me. We need help. I yelled back. The driver's eyes widened with fear. But instead of driving away like any sane person would do in this situation, they decided to follow me. As we drove along the winding road, we both heard an ear-piercing screech from behind us. I glanced at my rearview mirror and saw our pursuer barreling towards us with a speed that made my breath catch in my throat. Without thinking, I swerved off the road, pulling a sharp turn that bought us precious seconds as our attacker faltered in its momentum. My newfound ally followed suit without hesitation. Finally, more headlights appeared in the distance help had arrived. Multiple vehicles with flashing lights made their way toward us. Sirens filled the air bringing a small measure of relief. Seeing the approaching law enforcement officers, the creature halted in its tracks and quickly fled into the thick forest that surrounded us. As more people arrived on scene and tried to make sense of what had transpired that night, I recounted my harrowing experience to an incredulous audience. Later on, authorities combed through the area where we had seen the massive beast but found no trace of it. The driver who had stayed by my side told the police and me that he was a trucker passing through the area. He had heard tales of a large, dangerous creature lurking in these woods, but he had never believed them until now. We exchanged our thanks and relief for having survived the ordeal before parting ways at the end of the night. A few days later, local news reported several incidents within the nearby community where people and animals were brutally attacked or killed by an unspecified assailant. The description of the perpetrator didn't quite match that of any known animal, making an eerie connection to my encounter with the beast all too plausible. As time passed, communities in the area grew more fearful and vigilant, 
while law enforcement officials doubled their efforts to capture what they now suspected was no ordinary predator. Yet, despite their best efforts, no resolution was ever found. Word spread far and wide about the mysterious occurrences plaguing our region. People whispered in hushed tones about a terrifying monster from an ancient folklore terrorizing our lives a waking nightmare that would not be stopped easily. Unable to forget those who fell victim to this unstoppable monstrosity, I often find myself lying awake at night, wondering if this creature will ever be caught or if it will continue to torment my once peaceful town. March 2010 will forever be etched in my memory as a time of intriguing adventure and terror. Let me start by giving you some background. My name is Baxter McCree, and I live in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. At the time, I was recovering from an imploded relationship, trying out new hobbies to keep me occupied and recover emotionally. That's how I found myself in a remote cabin near the Ozark National Forest, trying, for the first time, my hand at amateur photography. My cousin Mosby swears his house is haunted. Jubal Adams declared excitedly while nursing his coffee at our tiny breakfast table during the monthly get-together with my friends from high school. Can you really blame him? Lila Tristano chimed in. Ever since Mosby watched that B-movie marathon on cryptids last week, he can't stop talking about creepy creatures haunting the woods near his house. We chuckled at Mosby's vivid imagination. A few days later, however, I found myself wondering about Jubal's cousin. While hiking through the forest to capture some breathtaking nature shots, lenses and camera jingling around my neck, I couldn't shake off an eerie feeling that persisted. It seemed like I was being watched by some unseen presence lurking just beyond my line of sight. Ah, uh, it's only nerves. I mumbled under my breath, trying to calm myself down. Determined not to let my irrational fear gain any traction within me, I pushed beyond my fear and tried to enjoy my newfound passion for photography in Mother Nature's mesmerizing embrace. As twilight descended upon the mighty oaks above me, I set up my tripod near a cluster of ferns for one last shot of the setting sun's farewell rays peering through the canopy. Flash. Click. Whirr. Just as the camera was preparing for another try at capturing nature's light display, my ears pricked at a spine-chilling sound. Swallowing hard, I told myself it must be a raccoon or squirrel, lurking around in search of a late-night feast of acorns. But it wasn't. No animal could have made that sound, a hideous blend of a hissing snake and crocodile's low growl, echoing through the trees. Suddenly, something enormous seemed to shift amongst the shadows, hidden in the deepening twilight. Who's there? I called out loud, not really expecting an answer. The grass trembled and rustled behind me as if some enormous unseen creature moved towards me slowly and deliberately. As if sensing the imminent danger closing in, I made a hasty retreat back to where I had set up camp earlier. The tense atmosphere persisted through the night as ominous sounds kept wakeful watch on our frightened group. Eventually, exhaustion took over. I surmised that whatever creature or figment of our imaginations troubled us earlier had claimed its space elsewhere in this vast wilderness. Unshaken by the unsettling events that occurred beneath the forest's forbidding shadows, we collectively decided to extend our stay and explore deeper into these immense woodlands. Earl suggested we accompany him further than he usually ventured on his expeditions around these parts. We should have listened to our instincts and turned back when we sensed things becoming more sinister by the minute 
as if nature were trying to dissuade us from intruding any further. Eventually, as if pulled by an unseen force, amid swaying trees casting long spidery fingers onto the ground below, we stumbled upon a clearing wherein lay an ancient car wreck, its breaking point hardened by time. While broken glass glittered darkly in the evening sun, something much more menacing caught our attention. What appeared to be lengthy gashes clawed across one side of the car with astonishing power. As we stared at the wreck, an unsettling feeling washed over me. We glanced at one another, our faces reflecting our shared terror. Let's get out of here, I said urgently, and the others nodded in agreement. On the way back to camp, Earl finally broke the silence. Do you think it's after us? he asked nervously. I don't know what that thing is. I admitted, trying to keep fear from setting in further. But whatever it is, we have to get out of this forest as soon as possible. Guys, listen, Sarah interjected. We can't just abandon everything and run in fear. There could be a reasonable explanation for that sound, or maybe an escaped animal. Whatever it was clearly did some damage to that car, remarked Jake, his knuckles turning white as he gripped the straps on his backpack. We'll talk more once we reach camp, I told them. As we trudged along hurriedly, there was no doubt in my mind that we needed to leave this place immediately. Once we had returned to the safety of our campsite, the group collectively decided that it would be best to contact park rangers for help. Grabbing my satellite phone, I dialed their emergency number and recounted our frightening experience. Much to my relief, they promised to send an officer to take a look at the situation within several hours. During this time, instead of waiting nervously for help to arrive, we busied ourselves by preparing a swift departure from the forest should things escalate any further. Hours later, as dusk crept upon us, a park ranger arrived and spoke with us about our findings. He listened intently and took notes as he questioned each member of our group. His expression grew increasingly serious when he heard about the unearthly sound we'd encountered earlier. This might be related to something our team's been working on for some time now. He hesitated, then continued. We've had numerous reports of strange sounds and sightings in this area, as well as attacks on wildlife. All descriptions match a reptilian humanoid creature, though we can't confirm its existence. Nonetheless, we have to treat this seriously based on the incidents that have transpired. We shared astonished looks as the ranger proceeded to give us instructions to pack up our belongings and get ready to leave the forest immediately. As we were about to embark, an ear-piercing shriek echoed through the trees, stopping us in our tracks. The ranger's face was a mask of fear and worry as he tried to maintain calm. All right, move with haste and stay together, he ordered us sternly. Our hearts raced with every step, the adrenaline coursing through our veins as we sprinted toward the direction of our closest exit. The ranger led from the front, which was reassuring yet terrifying all at once. Unexpectedly, Sarah tripped on a tree root and fell hard onto the ground. Without thinking twice, I doubled back and helped her regain her footing as she winced in pain from her injured leg. Suddenly, the creature emerged from the shadows, its massive body hulking before us with terrifying speed and efficiency. Its vicious teeth gleamed in the half-light, its scaled flesh shimmering with menace as it let out another monstrous roar. The ranger acted quickly, grabbing Sarah's arm and pulling her away while yelling at Jake and me to run for our lives. I caught one last glimpse of the horrifying creature, as we slowly managed to put some distance between us. The park ranger bravely fought back against it in a desperate attempt to hold it off long enough for all of us to get out safely. 
Hours after escaping that harrowing experience, I sat in a nearby emergency room waiting area. Sarah was being treated for a broken ankle. Jake had relayed the details of our pseudo-encounter to the authorities, and they were going to initiate a search for the ranger. In the end, we managed to survive the dreadful encounter with that mysterious monster. My heart still mourns for the brave ranger who put his life at risk so that we might live. Fear of what had transpired in the forest lingered in my mind long after we left, and I would often find myself reminiscing about the unfortunate casualties of that monstrous creature's wrath. One peculiar afternoon, as I bit into the unexpectedly spicy ghost pepper chicken wings I had just made, the doorbell rang. October 31, 2021, was Halloween night, and I was spending at home alone in my Sacramento, California, house. The doorbell had interrupted my thoughts of the bland parties I had attended in previous years. My name is Lionel Winterbottom not a name you'd hear too often. I reluctantly patted my mouth with a napkin and walked toward the door. Right off the bat, a group of kids was standing on my porch in their costumes, accompanied by their chaperones, who were cheering them on from the sidewalk. Trick or treat! They shouted upon seeing me. I smiled weakly at them and dropped some candy into their bags before shutting the door. Glancing at my wristwatch, I knew there was still some time left before trick-or-treaters ran out altogether. Looking out through my living room window, I could see families enjoying Halloween activities down the street. Later that night, as the last candy-seeking children had disappeared and left their trails of laughter behind them, a sudden, loud crash sounded from behind my house. It echoed through the darkness making me jump in fright. In good spirits about Halloween horrors earlier, now I was genuinely unnerved. Why would someone throw a brick at a shed if there's nothing to loot? One neighbor whispered to another on the phone once something like this happened before at his place. Gathering my courage and not wanting to scare any fellow neighbors that might have come by for some harmless pranks, I decided to head outside myself. With each step towards the backyard, pangs of sheer skepticism filled my thoughts as I anticipated encountering some teenagers giggling away behind trimmed hedges. Cautiously rounding the corner into the backyard, shadows cut across my lawn under moonlight, unnervingly enshrouding the area. My fists were bald, ready for action, and my heart be echoed in my ears. And there he was, crouching by the garden shed, a tall, hooded man with black gloves and tools arranged in an unusual fashion on his belt. I realized with dread that this was no Halloween prank. It was a chilling reality. My heart pounded wildly as I hesitated to make my next move. The hooded figure didn't seem to have noticed me yet. His attention was focused on prying open my garden shed door. The moment stretched out like thin rubber, and I couldn't resist speaking up any longer in pure terror. Hey, what do you think you're doing? I blurted out. The hooded fiend glanced at me with his icy gaze and stood still, sizing me up. For a brief moment, we stared at one another, and a bead of sweat formed on my forehead. Without warning, the cold glass eyes of the intruder shifted their attention back towards the shed door and resumed their task as if I had said nothing at all. I knew I needed to stop him, or else whatever depraved plans he had laid out for tonight would undoubtedly come into fruition. A surge of courage rushed through me, propelling me forward. Our limbs collided violently as we tangled in battle. Fists slammed into flesh and guttural grunts emanated from two mortal bodies locked in a struggle for survival. Soon realizing that I was fighting a losing battle against the hooded figure's brute strength, 
I desperately glanced around for anything that could be used as a makeshift weapon. My hand clasped onto a fiberglass pole from the garden tools the man had knocked over during our struggle. I managed to crack him in the head with the pole just before he could reach into his pocket, likely for his own weapon. Recoiling from my strike but ultimately undeterred by it, the hooded man lunged at me with renewed intensity. With renewed intensity, the hooded man attacked me harder, causing us both to stumble into the yard. We found ourselves near the edge of the forest that bordered my property. Trees hid what remained of the moonlight, making it even harder to discern what was happening. I struggled to keep up my defense, but desperation fueled my efforts. My grip on the fiberglass pole tightened as I tried to land more hits on this intruder, who seemed intent on bringing harm to me and my home. Suddenly, the hooded figure grabbed hold of me and threw me against a tree. My head crashed into the trunk with blunt force, disorienting me. I could feel myself losing consciousness. The pain urged me to take a risk, hoping someone would hear me. Help! Please, someone help! I screamed into the night as panic clawed at my throat. The man didn't pause or react to my cry for help. As he rushed towards me again, this time reaching for his own weapon, a switchblade, I mustered all my strength and swung the fiberglass pole one last time. The blow connected with his hand, and with a loud grunt he dropped his weapon onto the ground. Incredibly enough, his face betrayed no emotion or fear. He glared at me fiercely with an intensity that made my blood run cold. Suddenly, the front door of my house burst open. Presumably one of my neighbors had heard my desperate cry for help after all. The glare of their flashlight flickered over us both, revealing a crowd of concerned faces standing ready to assist. Realizing he was outnumbered and exposed in the harsh light that illuminated my front yard clearly now, the hooded man made a split-second decision to flee rather than fight. Without a word or any reaction apart from that chilling glare one last time in our direction, he sprinted off into the dense shadows of the forest beyond before any of us could react or attempt to stop him. The police arrived soon after, taking statements from me and my neighbors who had come to my aid. The hooded man was identified as a serial burglar who had been operating in our area, known for his brutal tactics and cold demeanor. The community was relieved that the perpetrator was exposed by my encounter. The subsequent manhunt led to his arrest within days. He had been dangerous, but very human after all, no supernatural element played a part in this terrifying ordeal. As they closed the case, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that lingered in the air. Although it ended relatively well for me given the circumstances and the intruder was captured, I knew it was essential never to forget those who were not so fortunate and had to suffer at the hands of such unfeeling criminals. Grateful to have survived this ordeal without any major injury, I went on with my life, always keeping a more watchful eye on my surroundings and cherishing the sense of community that had ultimately come to my rescue that fateful night. The sun was a hazy blob on the horizon straining to peek through the rust-colored clouds. Murphy and I had set up camp on the outskirts of Grimsby Forest, preparing for another night of hunting. It was easier these days, with all the technology at our disposal, and we enjoyed the thrill of the chase. I was good at my job, our trophies mounted up over time. Murphy lit a fire, cracking jokes about everything from politics to musical pop culture. His humor put me at ease as we prepared dinner, smoked venison with a side of wild rice. Hey, Murphy! I chuckled in between bites. 
Why did the chicken go to seance? Murphy sighed but played along. I don't know why. To get to the other side. I grinned. He smirked and shook his head. Man, you're worse than my grandpa. As darkness settled in, we gathered our equipment and set out. We navigated the dense forest with ease under a moonless sky, our high-powered flashlights enabling us to search for signs of our prey. An hour into our hunt, we encountered something neither of us could have predicted, an enormous snake-like creature that seemed to be, of all things, feasting upon another poacher who had gotten there before us. The sight was repulsive and unnatural, its slick scales coated in blood and viscera. Murphy turned to me in wide-eyed panic. What? What is that thing? I don't know, I stammered. My heart raced in my chest. Gone were the light-hearted moments of humorous banter around the campfire. We stood frozen as we watched this monstrous being gorge itself on the poor soul it had claimed as its latest meal. Suddenly aware of our presence, it twisted its grotesque head toward us, emitting a horrid hissing sound that resonated through the deepest parts of our souls. The look on Murphy's face told me he couldn't comprehend what he was witnessing. I shared his disbelief, yet I knew we had to run, to survive. Not wasting another second, we frantically turned and bolted through the underbrush, branches snapping underfoot and thorns tearing our clothing. Desperation fueled our every step as we navigated the seemingly endless depths of the dark forest, barely able to recognize their familiar surroundings distorted by terror. We plunged ahead, desperate to put as much distance between us and the horrifying serpent. Yet with each labored breath and pounding footstep, it felt as if our pursuer drew closer and closer still. Suddenly, a scream pierced the night, Murphy's last cry. I tried calling out to my friend, but the words caught in my throat as I was forced to accept Murphy's fate. There wasn't anything I could do for him anymore. My legs burned with exhaustion as I sprinted further into the night. Realizing now that this bizarre and vicious creature had already sensed its next meal, me. It slithered through the woods with supernatural speed, getting nearer even as I struggled to evade its hungering grasp. The chase intensified. Wild thoughts of doom clouded any remaining clarity of mind or strategic judgment. A fleeting hope arose. Perhaps there was a way to evade this malevolent fiend lurking at my heels. Any chance to reevaluate how it could possibly be outmaneuvered. I kept running, hoping to confuse the creature by zigzagging through the trees. Eventually, my legs gave out, and I tripped over a large root, falling hard onto the cold earth. In the quiet aftermath of my tumble, I noticed something strange. There were no sounds of pursuit, no hissing or slithering, just a deafening silence. It was as if the creature had simply vanished into thin air. As much as I wanted to call for help or return to Murphy, I simply couldn't bring myself to utter a sound or retrace my steps. There was no logic in returning to a potential death trap. Instead, I decided to head towards the nearest town, hoping someone there could help me understand what happened that night in Grimsby Forest. Wearily, I made my way through the trees until the first glimpses of morning light illuminated my path. As I reached town, I stumbled upon an old woman walking her dog. She noticed my ragged state and, despite her quizzical expression, offered assistance. Her name was Mabel, and she was a local historian who invited me inside her home to rest and talk. I recounted my horrific experience while Mabel listened intently. When I finished my story, trembling with emotion, 
she cracked open an old tome filled with local legends and showed me an illustration that made my blood run cold, an enormous snake-like creature much like the one Murphy and I encountered. Mabel explained that this sinister being was known as Fenris, the forest's ancient guardian. According to legend, Fenris had existed since time immemorial and defended Grimsby Forest against those who sought to exploit its resources or disturb its peace. The reason behind Fenris' violence became clear. We were intruders on its territory, and Fenris saw us as threats not just to itself but also to the forest it protected so fiercely. Mabel offered her sympathy for the loss of Murphy, and urged me never to return to Grimsby Forest. Before leaving her house, I thanked her for her help and went on my way, carrying the heavy burden of the truth. As I left town, I couldn't help but look back towards Grimsby Forest, knowing full well that the colossal snake still slithered through its undergrowth. In my heart, I silently mourned for Murphy and others who might unknowingly cross paths with Fenris. A unique and eerie air has now settled over my mind. It was impossible to continue hunting as if nothing had happened. The thought of encountering Fenris once more or another being like it filled me with dread. So I eventually left this life behind, unable to shake the grisly memories that haunted me. Murphy's last scream echoing in my ears. Although I chose a new path free from danger and the shadows of Grimsby Forest, the chilling knowledge of Fenris' existence followed me wherever I went, forever seared into my thoughts. The night we encountered Fenris changed everything for me, not just what I believed about the world but how I viewed my own existence. In some small way, Perhaps that sinister guardian taught me a valuable lesson, that some places are best left undisturbed, and some legends are better left unchallenged. In September 2017, I embarked on a peaceful solo camping trip in the Monongahela National Forest part of the Appalachian Mountains. My name is Silas Montgomery, and let me tell you about the experience that haunts me to this day. The first day of my trip was spent hiking, photographing the breathtaking scenery, and setting up camp in a small clearing. After securing my tent and gathering wood for a fire, I headed to the nearest stream to refill my water supply. As I dipped my canteens into the rushing water, a sharp and unpleasant smell invaded my nostrils. Curiosity getting the better of me, I followed the stench until I found its source, a bizarre symbol crudely painted in an oozing dark substance on a flat rock surface. Before I could examine it further, I heard an odd chuckling sound behind me. Startled, I turned around to discover a disheveled man with wild eyes standing just a few feet away. He appeared to be around sixty years old, with graying hair sticking out from under his stained and tattered hat. Are you looking at my artwork? He rasped with a toothy grin. His laugh was eerie, but trying to maintain composure, I replied jokingly. I've seen worse modern art. Ignoring my weak attempt at humor, he continued staring at me with unnerving intensity. You best stay away from there, he said in an almost exhausted tone before wandering back into the forest from whence he came. I decided not to give much thought to his words. After all, it was just some guy wandering around. That night as I sat by my fire staring into the flames wondering whether marshmallows had any real expiration date, or if they could be permanently held hostage into compliance by S. Moray's enthusiasts. I faintly heard what sounded like an anguished animal cry echo through the forest. It may have been the fire affecting my thoughts, or perhaps I realized just how alone I was, 
but I couldn't shake the feeling of unease. The next day, as I walked further into the wilderness, I stumbled upon abandoned camping equipment scattered on the forest floor. Tents were torn apart, supplies lay dumped out of bags, and it appeared as if a violent struggle had taken place. The remnants of previous campers made me extremely uncomfortable. Surely they wouldn't have left without their belongings by choice. As night fell again, I returned to my campsite to find it in disarray. My fire pit was destroyed, and my tent ripped to shreds. Concerned for my safety, and thinking it might be best to leave at dawn, I laid down in the tatters of my tent for a restless sleep. Sleep never had a chance to fully take hold as the terrifying wails and sounds of snapping branches reached my ears not long after dusk swallowed any sign of daylight. My heart raced as I reached for a flashlight and my trusty pocket knife, venturing cautiously into the darkness. The beam from my flashlight revealed claw marks etched deeply into tree trunks. Suddenly, before I could even process what was happening, a massive creature with wickedly sharp teeth and matted fur charged at me with force unlike anything I'd ever seen. Its bloodshot eyes locked onto me with undisguised fury. Instead of finding inspiration for hilarious height-based observational comedy, this monster seemed likely to turn me into a crispy snack if given the chance. I tried to maintain distance from the creature, backing away slowly while keeping the flashlight focused on its twisted form. It continued to snarl, its breathing heavy and labored. Suddenly it lunged toward me, its massive claws reaching out with terrifying speed. Before I knew it, my legs carried me through the forest as fast as they could manage. The creature chased after me with a frightening determination and agility. Each time I risked a glance back, I saw its red eyes piercing through the darkness. As I stumbled over roots and rocks, I remembered that I had brought a phone with me. Though the signal was weak in this area, calling for help was my only chance of survival. While still running frantically, I dialed emergency services. When I finally got through to someone on the other end of the line, I breathlessly explained my dire situation and begged for assistance. The operator assured me they would send help as quickly as possible but emphasized the remoteness of my location might delay their arrival. My legs began to tire, but fear compelled me to push on. Eventually, I reached a clearing near a small lake where fishing boats were docked in a row. Desperately searching for an escape route, I jumped into one of the boats and pushed off with the oar into the water. With some distance between me and the shore, I felt a small sense of relief wash over me. The creature paced along the water's edge, growling and snarling but refusing to dive in after me. Its massive frame appeared hulking even from this vantage point, its tangled fur matted with dirt and what looked like blood. Its distinctive odor, something akin to rotting meat mixed with damp earth, drifted across the water toward me. Help eventually arrived at the lake. It seemed like hours later though it was probably less. Searching for me nearby had been difficult, fortunately. One of the rescuers heard my exhausted call as I shouted for them from the boat. As they approached, they were able to hear my shouted warnings about the creature. They signaled for me to stay put and navigated warily to the shoreline. I was eventually picked up by a search and rescue team who took me back to safety. The remaining search and rescue members scoured the area for any signs of the creature but it had seemingly vanished into thin air. The events of that night have left their mark on me. I spend my days attempting to reconcile with a nightmare that should have annihilated me or unraveled any rational sense of reality. As for the creature, it seemed to have disappeared into the wilderness without a trace.
leaving nothing behind but chilling reminders of its gruesome pursuits. The abandoned campsite still haunts me, those poor campers who fell victim to the creature's wrath. Despite coming away from that ordeal with my life, I can't help but mourn those who met an unimaginably brutal fate with no one nearby to answer their screams for help. Since my encounter, I've steered clear of forests and camping trips altogether, painfully aware that some questions should never be pursued. Some creatures are best left undiscovered and ancient mysteries left unsolved. Subsequently, I will continue my life with this newfound outlook. A simple existence without exploring the dark corners lurking beyond the boundaries of our known world. The week had been a mundane one with nothing but paperwork and an occasional lost hiker seeking my assistance. My name is Rolf Sterling a park ranger at Lassen Volcanic National Park in California. There's something about the smell of the crisp pines that gets my spirits soaring it has been my escape from the daily grind. One afternoon, I was patrolling near the volcanic section of the park when I came across peculiar tracks in the dirt. They were unlike any animal tracks I had seen before. They were like elongated claw marks that appeared to drag a few extra inches behind each step. The strangeness of the marking didn't bother me too much, as I had seen plenty of odd things in nature over my years. But something about this was unsettling. As I continued on my rounds, gathering trash that inconsiderate visitors had left behind, my radio suddenly erupted with static. It seemed almost deliberate an artificial feeling to it rather than normal radio interference. What the? I muttered as I tried to adjust it, but no matter what frequency I tuned to, all that came through was static, an eerie pulsation of sound growing stronger with each passing moment. Consequently, I decided to drive down to the ranger station to get it checked out. As I approached HQ, Davy. Our communication officer stepped out with a perplexed expression on his face. Hey, Davy, is your radio working? I asked as he approached me. Nah, he replied with a frown. I was just about to ask you the same thing. Mine's gone all haywire. I couldn't help but feel my curiosity spike. There's never been a time when our equipment suffered from such widespread malfunctions all at once. We returned inside the building together and set about attempting to pinpoint any possible causes for this strange phenomenon. Just then we heard frantic knocking on the door. I rushed to open it and found one of our maintenance crew, Becca, standing there wide-eyed and breathless. Her voice quivering, she spoke. There's something out there on the trails, something impossibly large and terrifying. We exchanged wary glances before she led us outside to show us what she had found. As we followed her deep into the woods, darkness had crawled and uninvited, wrapping its arms around us tightly. Sure enough, we reached the spot where she had encountered this thing. What did you see? I asked her as Davy checked his radio again. She paused for a moment, trying to find words to describe what she saw. It was massive. It looked like a misshapen bear-like creature with bloody claws trailing behind it. While validating our prior concerns, her story still had me convinced that it was just the recent panic which had ruled over my earlier intentions, assuming they were mere accidental imprints. Just then, Davy gasped and dropped his malfunctioning radio. His face was drained of color as he uttered a single word. Glowing. I didn't have to ask what he meant. We could all feel the air crackling around us, charged with energy that felt foreign and dangerous. We remained frozen to our spots while our hearts raced faster than a suitless astronaut on meth. 
Suddenly there was an unearthly growl that reverberated through the wooded area around us. It seemed almost as if the trees surrounding us were thrumming in fear of what was near. I remember thinking to myself how absurd these feelings of fanatical terror truly were, as if some cryptic creature had invaded our terrain and placed upon it marks unbeknownst to human eyes. At a shuddering distance, we spotted the creature Becca had described towering over us like a distorted mixture of bear and man, but not quite. Its limbs elongated like it grew them in haste, pieced together in a horrific manner that defied all logical conventions. The beast bared its fangs as it snarled with primal hunger. As we prepared to run, the creature lunged at us, claws enlarging further before looking to swipe at our petrified forms, without any intention of stopping its ravenous pursuit. We knew we couldn't fight this monstrosity, so we split up and fled deeper into the woods, running as fast as our legs could carry us. Becca screamed out for help but it didn't seem like anyone heard her. The terrifying growls of the creature echoed behind us, a chilling reminder of the relentless pursuit. As I struggled to catch my breath, Davy, who was right beside me, desperately searched for his radio. His face fell when he remembered that he had dropped it during the initial encounter with the beast. Desperation gripped us as we realized that calling for help was no longer an option. We kept moving, tripping over roots and shoving branches out of our path. Frequently glancing at each other, we tried to communicate through our gazes, suggesting different routes or potential hiding spots. Unfortunately, no place around us felt safe enough to escape this horrifying predator. Our pace quickened when the creature's wails became more palpable, as if it was taunting us for the futility of our escape attempts. A sharp pain shot up my ankle as I stumbled over a protruding rock, but I forced myself to keep going nonetheless. I barely had time to react when Davy abruptly stopped in his tracks and yanked me back with him, saving me from crashing headfirst into a hidden pit filled with jagged rocks. We exchanged weary nods, silently thanking each other for watching out for one another but our moment of relief was short-lived as the creature's growls came closer and closer. Becca tripped and fell hard against the tree trunk but managed to pick herself back up in frenzy-driven haste less than a heartbeat later. She murmured something under her breath which sounded suspiciously like an odd phrase she had read from a book about strange animals she found in the maintenance shed earlier that day. It sent an unwanted shiver through me, but I quickly dismissed it, knowing that folklore had no place in our current predicament. The creature lunged at us once again, this time closing the gap between us with frightening velocity. It barely missed Becca and Davy, as they managed to dodge its massive claw milliseconds before it struck them. My heart was pounding in my chest and I found it hard to breathe as terror took control of my thoughts. I knew I had to keep moving, but my legs felt like lead, betraying me during the most crucial time of my life. And then, as if in answer to our desperate prayers, we stumbled upon a cabin hidden amidst the foliage, its door nearly obscured by years of overgrowth. We didn't waste a moment's thought on who it belonged to or why it was there. All that mattered was that it could potentially offer us sanctuary from this relentless monster. We rushed inside, barricading the door with whatever we could find, old furniture and discarded debris. We listened for the beast outside but for now, it seemed like we had managed to escape its grasp. With every passing moment that the creature didn't break through our makeshift fortress, a surreal sense of relief set in among us. We knew that we couldn't stay there indefinitely, but after our harrowing ordeal, even the illusion of safety felt like a blessing. When daybreak finally came, we realized that we needed professional help. The three of us cautiously left our hiding spot and made our way back towards civilization. 
We had no doubt that we would be questioned about what had happened. Rational minds would surely dismiss our story as some kind of absurd hallucination or misguided prank. But regardless of how others perceived our experience, or how many times we were forced to recount our chilling encounter with this horrifying creature, one thing was certain. We would never forget those terrifying hours spent fleeing from the nightmarish being that bowed neither to logic nor physics. We were reminded of our fallen comrades, people we worked, laughed, and moved forward with, who had not survived to tell their stories. We knew that the questions would never leave our minds, but somehow, we also knew that we needed to move on and live our lives. The beast remains lurking in the dark woods, a force waiting to be unleashed upon unsuspecting and vulnerable souls. Although we couldn't defeat it or even understand what it truly was, we lived to tell our tale, a gruesome warning of the horrors that lurked just beyond the realm of human comprehension, unspeakable terrors hidden within the shadows of the forest.